Greetings, everyone. I'm Adam Albion, SELA Executive Director. And I'm Aisha Shokatullah, SELA Network Manager. Welcome, everyone, to SELA's first virtual event. I know, our pioneering attempt, laden with all the perils associated with an online meeting. What could go wrong? A lot. Didn't you hear about the lawyer in Texas who got stuck online in a cat filter? I did. Actually, Aisha, you do look different. Do you have your cat filter on now? No, this is the real me. But I see you have your executive director filter on. Ah, it's true. In reality, I'm still in bed in my pajamas. It is, after all, 7 a.m. here in Tampa, Florida. And it's 5 p.m. here, Adam, on the other side of the world in Islamabad, Pakistan. Oui, the opposite side of the planet. So, if I wanted to gesture at you from where I am, actually, I should point straight down into the ground. The opposite side of the planet? No, Adam. If you want to make a gesture to the whole SILA team who worked so hard to produce today's event, you should look up with your arms in the air, palms to the sky. I, I will do that. Thank you. Actually, today's virtual event is truly worldwide, streaming to 13 time zones. It brings home to you the size and the scope of our global leadership community. And soon we'll be bigger than the Oscars. Uh-huh, and more entertaining. Having the main stage to ourselves like this is wonderful. In fact, it's a shame we invited anyone else to this virtual event at all. And I'm sure the audience agrees with me. I'm sure the truth is the opposite, Adam. Well, let's have another poll and have a vote on eliminating the rest of the speakers altogether. You realize that Arj is waiting off stage and can hear every word you're saying? Arj Wignaraja, the chairman of the SELA board. <laughs> and Anand Sharma. Ah, uh, well, we're just keeping the stage warm for them, aren't we? Let's have both gentlemen come up on stage. Just for the record, I had nothing to do with the last turn in dialogue. Arj. Hey, Adam. What I hey, said Arj. was just for the How punters. So far, so good. Even without seeing you, and I'm great to hear you. And I have to say, yeah, it, it's been over a year since SELA uh, 7 back in, uh, back in Colombo, uh, January 2020. And uh, wow, it's, it's been a pretty crazy year for, for a lot of us, right? Personally, professionally. Um, and um, Anand, I'd love to uh, get a sense of, you know, somebody uh, who, you know, you're known for, you know, setting clear direction, having a strategy, developing a plan, going into execution, sort of, you know, that's, that's very much part of your DNA and, and a lot of what you've kind of taught us as well. Um, and I'm just wondering, during this whole lockdown, right, uh, with all of its related restrictions, um, how how have you, you know, how has that affected uh, the way you get things done? Just, you know. Thank, thanks, Art. First of all, to everyone, good morning from North Carolina. I'm Anand Sharma. I'm sorry you can't see me. One of the glitches. Again, Arj, uh, after the initial shock of not traveling, which we've been traveling, Anu and I've been traveling constantly uh, and sulking for some time, by May, we decided to take advantage of the situation. And we both decided to eat healthy at home because we were not traveling and exercise. And I played a lot of golf, more golf than I played in the last 10 years. And as a result, I have achieved my weight that was about 20 years ago, and I feel healthy, wow. feel good. So it has been a uh, bonus, COVID bonus wow. for us. So I'm, 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 I'm very good. I'm doubly disappointed we're not getting to see you, Anand. That that would that's just fantastic to hear that. Uh, really, um, Anand, one of the um, things that we did also with. Uh, obviously, as, as part of this event, is we polled our alumni um, uh, with, you know, we really just asking them about uh, how they've been coping through the pandemic, uh, you know, adjustments in their uh, behavior, their situation, both uh, professional and personal. And, um, you know, one of the um, things I'd like to uh, share with you is uh, a 
a set of findings from um, from that survey and um, let me present that um, uh, can you see this Anand yes I can see it great which means uh, everyone else can see it as well um, so uh, Anand, we asked uh, our alumni, you know, what, what has been their situation during the pandemic, uh, you know, work-wise. And, you know, thankfully for most, they were relatively unscathed. But, you know, we had a fair number of our alumni, um, you know, up to about 40% that faced something either staff reduction, a pay reduction, or, or both. Um, and one of the questions I had for you, Anand, is, you know, as a you know, as an advisor to a number of board uh, boards around the world, different corporates, uh, you've probably seen uh, you know a varied set of responses by companies uh, during this pandemic, and I was intrigued to ask you whether any particular responses stood out to you. Well, you know, early adapters to change environment uh, who took a proactive action they did very well in terms of results, in terms of health, in terms of safety. In fact, one of the company that I'm on the board of had absolutely no negative impact in terms of uh, deaths due to COVID out of 12,000 people. And their results are almost same as the year before, which is quite an accomplishment uh, in terms of sales as well as in terms of profits. So it was very refreshing to see that many organizations, especially business organization, did not wait for the government help and took control of their own destiny. That was very, very encouraging to see. Right, right, good. Um, Anand, we also um, asked, uh, interestingly, you know, we wanted to get a sense from our alumni if their leadership style had uh, had kind of evolved uh, during the pandemic. And what we asked them on a spectrum was, you know, did they go more towards uh, control and more centralized uh, taking charge, you know, during uncertain times? Or did they go more towards, um, uh, you know, a more distributed, a more empathetic uh, style of leadership? And, and let me share what we, what we found. Um, and I don't know if, if you're surprised by this, but, you know, almost three quarters of our uh, alums talked about uh, you know, shifting or moving more towards being, you know, more empathetic in their in their style of leadership. Um, you know, if you think about a traditional leadership model, you'd think, you know, more turbulence, uncertainty, you start to tighten up and, and take more control. Um, does this surprise you? Is this something that you feel is, is the, you know, uh, makes sense uh, for, for Sila? No, I think this is the first time where people saw their colleagues and employees in very personal situations at home, in relaxed environment. So I believe this is truly a welcome pandem pandemic bonus that business leaders have become more human, more empathetic, yeah. and more uh, tilted towards the work-life balance issues. So right. I think it was really good that uh, we tilted to the right direction. Yeah. And um, you know we'll we'll also poll our audience on on you know their their style and you know any any sense uh, of you know change or evolution uh, as well. Um, but uh, Anand, we also you know asked them about their personal lives in terms and and kind of what you were alluding to a little bit around you know both the negative and positive aspects right of of uh, uh, the pandemic affecting them and. Uh, you know, uh, on the negative side, uh, uh, you know, and this I'm sure resonates with you as well, because, you know, a lot of over, you know, two thirds almost saying, you know, the inability to travel uh, yeah. was a really significant challenge. Uh, on top of that, of course, you know, there's a, a, a stress, there's anxiety, that there, there's, there's uh, some experience depression as well. Um, but coming back to you and, you know, you and Anu are, are you know, your, your, thrive on on traveling both for work for for pleasure for sila um how how did you manage this and and what were some of the other negative impacts that you you experienced well obviously as i said that not traveling was very uh big negative for us but after pivoting towards uh, taking advantage of the home situation we decided maybe we should start traveling 
nationally within US. And we started that in August. And then by November, we were able to go to India. Uh, that was the only country that allowed us to travel internationally. Right. And next week, we are planning to go to India again and Bangladesh. So looking forward to it. Wow. Again, you have to be careful. You have to be, uh, you know, use all the safety precautions. But most places, I think, are pretty safe to travel right now. So I'm looking forward to that. And well, that's, uh, that's wonderful to hear that, Anand, that, that, you know, it's not stopped you and Anu and, you know, you guys have been doing what you do. That That's fantastic. Yes. Um, on the positive side, Anand, just, you know, just the flip side of that question, you know, uh, and again, uh, you know, we, we uh, people talked about the time to reevaluate priorities, uh, increased uh, quality time with family, like you were saying, and also very interestingly, being a lot more now conscious of uh, consumption and expenditures, right? So that's something that uh, that's starting to take root. Um, Anand, I was wondering, you know, given the length of the pandemic, uh, do you feel these changes in behavior might be here to stay? As in, you know, have they become really now habit forming, or do you feel, you know, we'd want to rush back to the way things were the moment, you know, we feel it's safe or we 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 have got a vaccine? Well, I, I just hope that this new pivot towards, uh, you know, setting priorities and you know paying attention to family and work-life balance becomes a new norm. Uh, I'm sure it will not happen 100%, but even if 50% of the people retain this new consciousness, I think that will be very good bonus from pandemic. Yeah. And it, it's been interesting, you know, you really start to question what you are spending on as well. You know, so that yes. really, you're, you're much more conscious of that, which which I feel very, very fortunate to to have, you know, had time to reflect on. Um, and then the final uh, uh, question around, um, of course, um, have you already received a COVID vaccine? And, uh, you know, most people are expecting to receive it in the next three months to about a year. Uh, we had about 7% who, who've already received it. Um, uh, what about you, Anand? Have you already received well, uh, Anu vaccine? and I took our second COVID vaccine shot on February 9th. So we are very fortunate we were in the group that was allowed in the US. So we are very happy about that because that uh, helps uh, travel with us, travel for us. That, that's excellent to hear. And, and uh, just to, you know, our time is up, Anand, but just to wrap up, you know, we have a, maybe about 5% of our alums who, who seems quite skeptical about the vaccine. And I was just wondering if you can reassure them that, you know, that you've always looked this good. Of course, we can't see you, but that that your loss of hair is, is nothing to do with the, the vaccine and, you know, that it's completely safe, right? Absolutely. You know, uh, ours, the vaccine was developed in a record time. However, yeah. there was no corners that were cut. There were no shortcuts. In fact, uh, I was involved with the development of a uh, cancer medicine for a Swiss pharma company, and we were able to reduce the lead time from four years to six months without wow. compromising any of the scientific principles. So same thing happened with this vaccine because they used parallel processes and they used uh, very effective implementation. So this vaccine is very safe. In fact, more safer than the vaccines produced previously. That it's much more safer yeah. than the flu vaccine. So I think uh, people should have no hesitation in taking this vaccine. Great. Um, Anand, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, really appreciate uh, the ability to spend time with you as we kick off on this new adventure online. Um, March now. Thank you very much. And again, thanks for all of you who have put together this event. I'm really excited and looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Um, now going to hand back over to Adam and Aisha to take us through and tell us what's next. Certainly was an eye-opening session with Arjun Anand. Eye-opening. Well, yes, especially Anand. He was easy on the eye today. Uh, and actually, I learned a lot. Um, I had no idea that Anand got vaccinated in the head. <laughs> You're skating on thin ice today. Thin ice. Well, that's uh, that's global warming for you. You know, it's already 
February 2021. Under normal circumstances, we would have already had the SEMA 8 Academy and the reunion last month on a beautiful beach with golden sands in Malaysia. In a way, this virtual event is a substitute for the in-person reunion that we'd been planning. On a beautiful beach with golden sands in Malaysia? We just wanted to emphasize that for the benefit of our attendees in Texas. Oh, so cruel, Aisha. But looking forward to warmer and sunnier days, now that 2020 is finally behind us. Ah, yes. Well, 2020 did make us all rethink how we live and work, but also forced us to be creative in new ways. Um, did you acquire any new skills in 2020? Yes. <laughs> I learned to sleep through webinars. Why keeping my eyes open? How about you? Oh, well, <laughs> I learned how to be on screen on Zoom, you know, for those early morning SEMA board calls with Arj and Anand and get dressed at the same time. Oh, I should try that. But I think we should be most proud of the creative ways that our SELA members met the challenge in 2020 of keeping our network alive, engaging and supportive through these very turbulent times. Yes. Online learning, coffee clatches, SELA class and country virtual reunions, even a SELA music group. And two of our SELA ladies even went ahead and got married. Well, they'd probably finished Netflix. In case anybody thought that the global pandemic was enough to stop the SELA networking from buzzing, think again. And we have a 2020 Roundup video to prove it. Yes, yes, let's watch that now. Welcome to everyone. It is a delight to see you all here today.
So, um, because if this were a, a usual SELA program, there would be a coffee break now. I mean, virtual events don't have coffee breaks. Adam, Adam, they can, but the coffee is not included in this event. This is a free event. <laughs> I was actually thinking of those shrimp canapes uh, at the academies and the reunions. You always organize the most amazing coffee break nibbles. Those meatballs on toothpicks, Bill, I see you licking your lips. Those peanut sauce satays, those crunchy egg rolls and sweet and sour sauce. I mean, anyone on this uh, meeting who has been to Sealand knows what I'm talking about. Adam, maybe you'd like to change the SELA motto. Come for the connections, but stay for the egg rolls. <laughs> yes, but just don't tell the board. Well, our program now offers a different kind of experience. We have at least 30 minutes to enjoy networking and to visit the expo booths, which will go live as soon as I'm off camera. Welcome back to the first and glitch-free uh, SELA virtual event. For those of you who are still drinking coffee, settle down because I do believe that we have a fabulous panel coming up for you right now. Social and digital media, friend or foe? In 2020, distanced from our workplaces and shops, separated from our loved ones, we became more dependent on social and digital media than ever before. Some might even say, addicted to it. Audiences have been gripped by films like The Social Dilemma, which aim to expose the perniciousness of social media platforms, how human behavior is manipulated for profit, how technology hooks us. How big data is the new demigod? Is it hyperbole? Is there really anything new about companies influencing behavior for profit? And can we salvage the good from the bad? Four brave souls step up to navigate the turbulence. paying for the product, you are the product, it's very sort of big brother, right? You know, I think it's an interesting sort of concept to explore, but I think it's quite limiting. What are some of the, the great things that this unlocks for people, you know? So it certainly unlocks a level of choice, I think, for consumers. If you look at social media, it's also created a level playing field. Today, if I have a message and that message resonates, uh, I can still reach out and there's nothing unethical about it. How do we show the culture of a company just through comment moderation? It, because, you know, at the end of the day, social media is the front line of customer service. It's no longer just sales, it's actually customer experience. So, you know, the battle is attention. And I think that's what we need to understand. If I can retain someone's attention for a few seconds or a minute to my content, I win. That, that's, that's the new world order. In September 2020, Netflix released a movie, The Social Dilemma which topped its charts for that quarter with 38 million views. The film featured interviews with many former senior executives from Facebook, Google, Apple, and others. It explored the rise of social media and the damage it has caused to society, focusing on the exploitation and manipulation of its users for financial gain through surveillance capitalism and data mining. It went into depth on how social media's design is meant to nurture an addiction, manipulate its use in politics, and spread conspiracy theories and fake news. 
Perhaps our panel of Jedi Masters of Social Media can help us balance the disturbance in the fall. Welcome one and all. So good to help you, to help us imagine a way to reset the universe through social media. But let me start, let me ask you something. You've heard this. If you are not buying the product, then you are the product. So, are business interests at work behind social media the, the ultimate dehumanization? Social media skews our data. It is at the heart of criminal enterprise. Are you who wield these weapons against us somehow evil people? Should you not be sitting with me here on the dark side? <clears throat> Have I scared you, young Padua? <laughs> Yeah, that looked pretty frightening, aren't it? Ruani, go. So I am Bernadette Kastan. I'm a very firmly say that social media is not evil. Um, in some of our discussions, you know, we, we, you know, we say that, uh, you know, is it the medium that's evil or is it people that's evil? Um, social media can certainly be a little bit wicked. Um, and you know, the way I've sort of reflected on this is that it's really no different than any of the phases that other mainstream media have gone through. So social media hasn't really settled in our consciousness yet. So most media go through that period of adoption, then utopia. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, that we can speak to people, we can connect with each other. And television went through it. I'm sure radio went through it. Um, you know, and then from Utopia, we, we, we see forces coming out, advertisers coming out that can, can start manipulating and thinking about ways to, to, to drive usage or drive certain kinds of behavior. So then we're in that phase of demonization. So I think where we are right now is we're in this very unsettled phase of demonization in social media. Uh, so I'm going to take a stand and say that it's not evil yet. Not completely evil yet, but it can be a little bit wicked. Okay. Anyone else want to stand up for social media? Meta, <laughs> I know you are a user, and you you it's 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 core to what you do. You are you are good at it. You know what you're doing. Yeah. But are you doing some bad stuff? Um, well, I'm just going to start by saying I am. I'm not. I'm a personal user, but also I'm an advertiser. Uh, given that during the pandemic, my business has become direct to consumer. Um, if you're going to call s social media evil, then call me complicit. Uh, I rely on getting everyone's data. I rely on knowing where you've been. I rely on cookies being tracked. Um, and then I use all that information or we use that information to literally find you for having come to our website and hunting you down until you make a purchase on my website. So this is what I do. And I'm being perfectly transparent about it. Is it evil? I think it's about, it's never about the tool or the medium, it's about how you use it. In certain particular cases, on the good side, by being honest and authentic about our offering and offering fabulous like customer service and being able to reply, it's been great because we've been able to get directly to people who are interested in our products on the assumption of those who we are hunting down want to be hunted. Um, of course, it's evil when it starts becoming manipulation, like we start saying one thing, we try to get them in to go buy something else. So what's the difference between manipulation and persuasion? Uh, I once asked this to Andrea Bednar and her answer was, well, it's your intent. So in that sense, I do think that um, it's easy when you're behind a screen to give opportunity for even commenters to write really mean things and troll and we get our fair share of that. Um, but as long as I think we're honest about what we're using it for, its intention, um, and and I do believe in my product, so I feel like if you use it, your life is better. So I don't feel bad. Uh, Meta, I was going to come back. Is it because of the product? Because you know you have a product that you feel is good for you, that it maybe allows you to say, look, I, I, I can be a little bit bolder, I can be more aggressive online or through media because... I, I sincerely believe what I have for you is going to make your life better. 
Sort of, that's part of it because consent is also super weird. Uh, in other parts, parts of what we do is also, you know, you can choose to, you, you can choose to opt out of our marketing. You can opt to not look at us, whatever. And we totally respect that. So it's not just a product. Um, I think there is an element of things that we choose not to do uh, just because we don't feel like if it were me as a customer, I would hate that. But there is, it is, it's really kind of a back and forth. It's partly product, but partly how we go into the details of how we choose to target, how we choose to say. Uh, so how the other person may perceive it is is actually quite important, if not more so. Okay, great. Uh, anybody else want to represent uh, the corporates and defend what you guys are doing? So, uh, here. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to look at when we are talking about social media is we kind of lump it all together as one. Uh, but if you look at it, there's a there's a user, social media user, people who are consuming that. There are corporates or marketers like Meta, to an extent me, uh, who are kind of targeting our customers or prospective customers there. And then there are platforms. Uh, which basically are facilitating that whole uh, traffic. And as Ruani said, uh, I think any new medium that comes about, there's always this this human cry that you know this this there's a doomsday scenario that this is bad for uh, the world, whether it's a television or a newspaper in the past. But if you look at it, social media is kind of helping us reach where we could not have reached in the past. Uh, for a small corporate or even an entrepreneur, social media is creating that level playing field saying, if you have the right message, if you have the right content, you could actually reach out to your audience uh, and targeted audience. You could segment it, target it, reach there. And it's kind of in conjunction with big data because that's what's kind of helping facilitate all of this. Uh, so from my standpoint, medium's there. It's for us to use how we use it. Uh, so yeah, I'm a big supporter and, uh, yes, that, does it lead to addiction? At times it does, but those things are within your control. Excess of anything is bad as they say. That's, that's how I look at it. Alok, you talked about big data. Let me share something with you. Do you see that number? Yep. Can you bring that down a little? Yes. How low do you go, Alok? <laughs> we read that 500 terabytes a day is what facebook collects in terms of data let me show you another number and let me raise this right up so you guys can see it too high that's 98 that facebook has 98 personal data points on you as they track you to market to you i don't know 98 facts about myself they do so the question I want to ask this panel is, yes, I understand you're saying, look, this is you know, kind of a, 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 a boosted up version of what used to happen before. But now, just given the, the, the data mining capabilities, the scale, right? The, is, it, is it gone beyond niche targeting and finding us to actually manipulating us and, and getting us addicted because they can predict stuff before we get there? Has, has it swung that far out? So uh, if you look at it, advertising has always been uh, condemned to be manipulative, right? You're always kind of reaching out with the uh, things that people may aspire to have, but may not need it. Uh, even if I go to a, a Walmart or a Kroger, you see as to how the aisles are scheduled basically for me to look at it and buy it so yes that is happening it's just that this is many fold more uh, but to that extent it's also a function of my ability as a consumer or a user to see what is important to me and how i kind of leverage that uh, i think to that extent i i appreciate the fact that there is so much more awareness today that all the data is out there in the open uh, four years five years back people thought that some of the information is still private to them. Today, everybody realizes that there is no private information. Everything that I'm doing is out there in the public. Uh, 
Is that intrusive? Absolutely is. Does that bother me? Used to bother me, may not bother me so much today because I have kind of accepted it and potentially I'm adapting to it. Uh, we are going through some of the most severe weather in Texas. And just before that, uh, I was hunting for uh, space heaters, which you generally don't need in Texas. So while you're Googling it, you're also saying, Alexa, can you send me options for space heaters? Previously, I used to be Alexa's listening to what my wife and I are talking about. So you tend to learn to coexist, if you may. Uh, and that's a change that is happening. Uh, and that's more in our head than the medium. Medium is there. And with the capability, it's, it's going to be intrusive. It's for us to see how we, we can coexist. I mean, that's just my view. I'll be happy to hear other panelists on that. Rahil, any, anything to weigh in on, weigh in on that? Sure. So I really want to add to this um, two perspectives. So one is that I do believe we are doomed. Um, you talked about 98 data points. Um, I, that's just what a typical advertiser like Meta would get access to. Facebook itself has 26,000 data points. That is more information on us than we would ever have in our, in our lifetime. Um, and this is information that they can link back to. They would know what trends to follow. They could predict things that you couldn't predict about your own self or your own personality. Um, so, and we're living in a data-driven um, world which is gonna be dominated by AI. So the, the other problem with that is that it's not even human anymore. So we're talking about systems that are gonna understand you and are going to feed you the type of content or the type of information that, um, you know, that, that you're looking for, but constantly bend you towards a certain opinion. That's why you see this bigger divide in the world where um, you know, the, the divide is actually growing. So given that, um, we need to be wary of that definitely. Um, we also need to be wary of that the privacy settings, for example, on Facebook uh, do allow you to um, uh, do opt out of certain things. But most people don't know about that. They are already, once you sign up for Facebook, for example, you're already opting in for a lot of information. Um, gathering. If that's why you're Googling something and Facebook shows you the ad, because they're, they're crawling up, uh, all around your, your mobile phone. Um, so that's that side of it. But as Alok pointed out, I think there is the, the bright side of it as well, where um, how do you leverage these platforms for good? What can you actually um, build from this? And I think that one thing that uh, these platforms or digital has done in general, it has, it has become the great equalizer. Um, if you look at the TikTok phenomena alone, um, in Pakistan, we're the 12th largest users of TikTok. Um, and what that means is TikTok is not a rich man's uh, urban class phenomena. It's a very rural, poor man, um, low income, their, their form of entertainment. We did a recent research and we found out that TikTok users in certain communities has gone above Facebook. And what that means is that we've got celebrities, we've got influencers, we've got a million people, a million followers, and these people are daily wage income earners. You know, they might not be able to afford their third meal, but they've got content that the world is ready to, to look at. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Um, I think we need to be cognizant about what it means, but I think we're going to see things that have never happened in the world before. Um, so we, you know, as, as the Chinese proverb goes, we may live in exciting times, or interesting times, I think we're living in that time. Uh, Rahil, just to follow up on that, they, they is, is there, a, you know, what, what you're saying about TikTok and Pakistan, that, that's, that's, you know, that's crazy, right? Just to even imagine that because you're thinking of TikTok, you know, there's rich kids doing crazy stuff and, you know, um, so there's entertainment, but do you feel there's an economic model for, um, you know, segments of the population that may not have had, you know, parts to monetize what they're doing online. It might be entertainment, but but are you seeing that change? Are you seeing parts to that? Exactly, exactly. So we have people um, that I've heard, um, you know, in, in the in the northern part of Pakistan that actually make like around a thousand dollars a month just by the influencer network that they have and the content that they're pushing through, which is unheard of in that type of segment. So it has now become um, an economic engine. People are selling products and services using platforms like these. I know communities and rural communities using WhatsApp to sell their, for example, their embroidery work to the urban cities. And all the business is being done through WhatsApp. Um, there's a lady sitting in, in a remote village. She set up a shop on Amazon and she's selling acrylic work uh, over there. 
And she might not know the ABC of Amazon, but she understands that there is a platform, there's a wider network out there, and she's she got her younger kid and more who is a little tech savvy, and they're doing that. So I think the that that's the other part to it that that divide where the where where people wouldn't have access to such markets is now actually becoming an opportunity for them. Okay. Um, so we're talking about some interesting divides here, right? So that you've got one, of course, people who have access to social media, people who don't, and then you've got the the affluent folks who are using it uh, possibly in, in certain ways, and now you've got some kind of equalizing that that you're starting to to point to uh rahil uh but there's another divide you know i mean you look at you guys i mean you ain't young right you've been around the block a few times all of you you can tell that i, I can see some of the grays you know you can't see mine but i can see yours right um there's maybe is there a is there an age divide here right i mean uh, are we too old for this stuff right um, is is this now just you know a whole two three generations behind us? They they know what they're doing. They they you know what are they doing? What are they doing? What do you guys know about them young kids? These damn kids. What are they doing? Rue, how about you? Um, yeah. So so thank you for that, Arj, and pointing out our <laughs> you know advanced years. Uh, so last year, I started a YouTube channel called Patta History. Uh, it's uh, a platform for telling animated stories of Sri Lankan history uh, online. It's actually directed at adults, but a lot of kids enjoy it too. Um, through that, I got to meet a whole bunch of you know twenty somethings, basically like Gen Zs who live and breathe online, digital natives, um, and I'm working very closely with them. So our storyboard artist herself, she's 23 years old, and uh, you know she's the one who sort of brings in you know the entire script to life. Uh, I am amazed at how sophisticated they are in how they navigate through social media. Right? I mean, they don't have. You know, one is they live ninety percent of their lives online, and you know they they don't they don't have any hangups about it the way that I do. You know, I the first time I remember getting you know a, you know getting unwanted interest on social media, I started freaking out personally. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of a story about uh, you know this young woman as we go along. But you know, one of the things that I'm sort of learning from them is. You know, they, 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 they don't give out their real information. So they're very comfortable with, you know, this fictitious world. They're very sophisticated about anonymity. You know, so there's no way that you can really trace who they are, where they are, which city they live in, their age. Um, so, and, and, and many of them don't use their real names. Um, they go on like social media fast. So there's, there's plenty of, you know, these, these young people um, while we think that they're addicted to it and, and they use different platforms than I do. So like I'm a Facebook oldie, I'm going to put it out there. Uh, but these kids, you know, they're on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, you know, very little of what they put out there exists and they, and they, they, they don't, they don't try and stick stuff to walls. Instead, they, they put out stories that disappear within a few, you know, within 24 hours. So you know, nothing can really be attributed to them. Um, and then they disappear for weeks on end, you know, so they will, you won't be able to catch them and they'll be on a beach somewhere. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about Ashwatha, the young woman who does our storyboarding. Um, so, you know, telling Sri Lankan story and it's, it's, it's history in itself is a bit of a minefield. Uh, you've got to keep a lot of people happy or, or not. You're, you're inevitably going to keep, you know, make people annoyed. Um, and we started publicizing, we started doing publicity for the channel and we started talking about the individuals in this channel and Ashwita, the storyboard artist, um, you know, her time was up. So we, you know, did a bit of a blast about her, the kind of work that she does. And then immediately within you know, 24 hours, she got you know, a thousand uh, you know, followers of people requesting to follow her. Um, and then she was managing that. And then uh, you know, a few of these got quite intense. So some people were like you know, young, young men who find her attractive or whatever. And then one or two of them got a little bit kind of abusive you know, on, on social media. And I saw them kind of leaving comments and then she was sending us like screenshots of the kinds of comments, people attacking her for you know, the, the, the work that we're doing. 
And I got a bit, you know, worried on her behalf. So I started asking her, I'm like, are you okay? You know, can we, you know, what can we do about this? Can you can we block it, report it? And she was like, it's fine, don't worry about it. You know, I'm used to it. And, yeah. and, and she said, I'm just gonna block the guy. I mean, you know, he's he's a friend of mine. I'm, at least I've known him. I'm fine with it, don't worry about it. And I was like, you know, can I get you a counselor? Like, what can we do kind of thing for her? But she was so cool about it. And then she just snapped back to normal within 24 hours. She's, you know, again, you know, posting her silly Instagram stories. Um, so they're very like sophisticated and comfortable online. And they're also used to the kind of conflict that can come when you're online as well. Um, you know, we don't really enjoy, you know, when you're sitting behind a screen, you naturally get a bit of bravado uh, in, in, in the YouTube comments or on Twitter. You know, these are, these are mediums that are absolutely trying to bring out that glibness, that trying to bring out sarcasm, glibness, um, you know, just kind of bravado, arrogance. It's the worst of humanity sometimes in the YouTube comments. Um, but you know, the, these, these kids have developed a defense against it. So, so I really think, you know, my, 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 my thinking is I'm going to start really trying to learn social media from people who, who know how to use it. And these are kids who are in their 20s. Not to say that we don't know, but there's certainly a cultural kind of divide emerging as well. And, and, and not to kind of you know, dominate this conversation on, on age. I know that uh, you know, my colleagues would really like to, to pitch in on this. But one of the divides I'm starting to see is, is the, the tr you know, tr basically that we're living in kind of a, you know, a post-truth world as it were, anyone can manufacture information, right? So if I stare, you know, if I, if I, if I put a camera on my face and I talk about alternative facts, um, I'm sure I can get that going, you know, if it's outrageous enough and it can be circulated. And you, you find people, and particularly in Sri Lanka, the, the scary thing is you've got, you know, six and a half million, uh, you know, Facebook accounts. And that's, you know, you know, more than one third of the population or nearly one third of the population. And the amount of, fabricated information that's being shared, um, you know, I, I've noticed it's really driving this kind of conspiracy. It's really driving a kind of influence. So there's people continuously digesting manufactured information that's unsubstantiated. So I think mean, one of the dangers that, you know, I know, I know, I know Rahil also mentioned is that how do we live in, how do we pass and how do we tease out what's really substantial, what's really substantive and what's really verified and how do we, ensure that the people who are using social media are starting to critique what they're what what they're absorbing in terms of information so i i'm, I'm living that one i'm battling it right now yeah let me let me pick on one thing you said and i'd like like uh, some uh, some of the panelists to respond to this you know some of you might remember a gentleman named michael cooley right and michael cooley says no masks you know you 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 the mask you wear at work the mask in the family the mask in your house. so it's all you and you should be you but you're saying what's interesting is you're saying people are now this next generation is developing a defense mechanism where they're they're fluid in these different identities that they're that they're carrying online and and you know that allows them to and they're wearing masks um is that ethical how you know have they gone okay uh, how do we do it so, if I may, I think part of the piece that you spoke about Arj, is the is the generational gap or differences that we are talking about. Like for me, social media is an adapted behavior. It doesn't come naturally or didn't come naturally. So when when I was growing up, it wasn't there. But for my kids, my nephews, my nieces, it's a natural behavior. That's the environment that they are growing in. Uh, so you started by saying, is it evil because it's taking all your data? And here the kids are developing the defense mechanism to counter that so-called evil of yours, so to say, uh, by things that Ruani mentioned. So they have uh, pseudo names, they have pseudo profiles, they know what they can share, what they can't share. Uh, even the platforms that you're on kind of go by which age or generation or your interest is. So you, you see some of us on Facebook, you see some of the youngsters on Snapchat and Insta. Uh, now you see Clubhouse coming in. So are you are you up to it with all the new technology that's coming your way or not? Uh, some of the professional guys are more on LinkedIn. Twitter has its own story, so to say. But to your point, are masks ethical? Now, 
you very quickly shifted from is the medium ethical to is the mass get ethical that the user is using. But you got to understand that's the defense mechanism that the users are coming up to counter what the medium is kind of throwing at you. Uh, and to that extent, I think just from an observer standpoint, sitting uh, from a 30,000 feet, it's fascinating to see how it's kind of panning out. Uh, so it's a game of cat and mouse. You think that the platforms are the ones who are winning. And then you see something like what happened with GameStop. So all the individual users got together, created a mass hysteria, if you could call it that, and took down hedge funds. I mean, that's unthinkable, unheard of. So yeah, it's 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 like uh, Raheel said, interesting times, and you just need to let it play it out yeah. and not be too judgmental as I as, as I see it. Meta, a question for you. I, I know, you know, when oftentimes, you know, you talk about leveraging, uh, you know, young folks, their knowledge, their adaptability, uh, you, you know, you, you throw folks at some new technology or tool and, you know, they go figure it out and, and uh, how are you seeing that, you know, is that the way forward? Should we all be, you know, kind of working on a model like that to, to come up to speed, uh, uh, leveraging, you know, the, the sort of next two, three generations who, who are just completely native on this job? Um, yeah, I think one of the fundamental differences in age is that the Gen X age group, like I'm in that age group, we're pretty much the last generation that grew up with analog as a foundation and digital. So we were the transition years. Anybody before pretty much grew up analog. So this is a world that's binary. Are we online or are we offline? Are we real or are we fake? It's very one-to-one. -one. And I think that is what may cause certain fears or hesitations because if you're not one of something, you're more of the other. Um, to the point of the youth and where things are going, once you're digitally native, like once we grew up with a reality where is, which is tabs, URLs, mediums, it's not just about online or offline. And if it's real or fake, in fact, the different rooms, locations and platforms available, if that is a part of your reality as you're growing up, it's just, you're just born in the swimming pool. You don't, you learn how to do the different strokes in the water just because we're born in the swimming pool. And that being said, looking at it from that lens, I think, um, it's not about being real or fake or masked. I think it's about personas. I mean, think about it in the analog world. If you know, I'm, I'm publishing my book right now and someone's like, can you give me an author's bio? I'm like, do I do my author's bio? Or like a resume, do I, you know, in my headshot, do I do one that's good for speakers? Do I do one that's good for books? Do I do a resume? How many of us have several different resumes in the past? Like if I'm gonna apply for job in consulting or architecture. So to a degree, we're kind of doing the same where you have a Rinsta, where you have a Finsta, where you have like a TikTok persona, where you have a Facebook, you know, that part of we think of it just an extension of more platforms where we can express ourselves. It doesn't seem so frightening. And where we're maybe used to two alone, they're used to like six. I had interns, you know, who helped with a Hoban platform. And of course, they were like what seems magical because they were able to figure things out so quickly it's not that it's any different. They just have access to different resources. Like if I don't know what to do, typically, you know, if people don't know what to do, they they wait for instructions. I'm going to say that. That's like the Gen X and above. Below, it's like, okay, where's the search bar? Where's the tutorials? They just have, it's just a different way of access. With that being said, we really can't have this conversation about social media without talking about Clubhouse. So I'm so glad, Alok, that you brought that up. That, I mean, a litmus test of, of is it about young or old? The, the first conversation I think used to be about fear versus comfort. Are you fearful or are you comfortable on a digital medium? Now I think we've graduated to a level of how do we actually use the medium for ourselves. Now I'm on Clubhouse. I don't know if you, you are. I have a couple of invites if people want and I think a bunch of us are on it. Um, Soph and I just tried an event the other day. We got like 67 people without announcing it. It would just happen overnight and that was just a start. Um, I've been going around. What I've noticed is the conversation of social media now is are you are you an information presenter or are you a follower? Are you a consumer or are you a producer? And that has become, I've seen people who are, you know, much older, like ministers of governments, getting on there and, and using the medium to make a statement. People who probably need help opening up their email, honestly, on their desktop. I've seen people who are super young, you know, looking for mentors, talking and sharing. It's the narrative is not whether if it's a good or evil, real or fake, but how do we then now take this product and 
integrate in our lives where we're actually um, doing something with it and using it to serve us. So I just want to sh shift that. So Clubhouse, I think, is going to be a place where we really see it's like a petri dish of how in 2021 are we with our relationship to social media just by watching what kind of conversations are happening, what roles people are playing. Right. Um, so, you know, I've got to get on TikTok. That's that's for sure. But now you're telling me I got to get on Clubhouse as well. All right, Matt, I'm going to I'm going to check this out. I got to figure this stuff out. But can I ask you this? Is it too late for social media to be considered a force for good? And, and you know, what I mean is as that pendulum just swung too far into just the commercial aspect of it, the, the fake news and the, and the putting people down a rabbit hole. So all you're hearing is, you know, just stuff that just reinforces all your biases. You know, so all of that scary stuff, right, that, that, that social media was kind of uh, the social dilemma was trying to like amp up and, and put in our face. Can you give me some hope? Can you give me some examples? Is, 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 you know, social media, can it be a real meaningful force for good? Sure, so let me jump in. So I am basically running, a, I've been running a company that works on behavior change and social impact. And I've been doing this for 15 years now. And a lot of the work we do is is interpersonal, right? So it, at the end of the day, we're working directly with communities on the ground. Um, and we're really talking about masses. We're talking about millions, hundreds and millions of people at the end of the day. COVID happened, um, everything came to a stop. You, we couldn't access the communities. These thousands of frontline workers couldn't get access to uh, the regular work that they were doing. And we had to make a conscious decision. Do we just wait for this to pass by? or do we act upon it? And that's where we pivoted um, a lot of our work into digital realms. And now in the last eight, 10 months, 70 to 80% of our revenue purely comes from digital and disruptive technologies. So the two things that happened, one, one, we started getting into VR and AR, and using that as creating empathy at scale, like creating those experiences. But at the same time, um, we were working on a project which uh, was catering to water and sanitation hygiene issues. And when COVID happened, um, the, the government, and it was for the government working with UNICEF, the, the access to the community stopped. So they were paralyzed. They didn't know how to reach out to these people on critical messaging as well as COVID now. So we suddenly took a shift. We had a digital community, but we activated it um, uh, pretty aggressively. And within a few, few weeks, we were becoming, we became the government's voice towards COVID response through our platform because we had a community of 50,000 people they're vibrant, engaged, um, and who, again, became our influencers. So they were the people who were further transferring our messages to communities further on. Um, and just in a matter of months, we were able to reach out to 32 million people through that platform alone around COVID and the regular stuff we were doing. And most interestingly, these frontline workers, we were able to re-engage them using platforms like WhatsApp, for example. And they, they became, they were providing us content, sharing that with communities. We found influences within communities. And the most remarkable feedback I ever got from a frontline worker was that our work gets unnoticed. No one even knows about us. And this is the first time that at least a few thousand people know my name because they've been able to see the work that I've been doing and that's been shared on, on digital. So that's the power of the impact that's definitely there. Another example is the government had another a big program on, uh, it was called the Cash Emergency Program. And um, and they had to reach out to people. They were they were willing to give out money to COVID-affected families, poor families. And again, they had three days left and 70% of people who deserved that, that cash grant weren't even registered because they couldn't reach out to them on a, such a short notice. So again, within three days, we reached out to more than 10 million people to at least get them registered and then they go through that screening process. So I think that shows you the scale that would never have existed in your traditional way of doing things, uh, which, which is amazing. And one last point I want to make here is um, an example, it's a global example, uh, this organization called Plan International. It's a global NGO. And uh, they have this big program uh, around girls' rights. Uh, it's called Girls Get Equal. And they did a digital survey with, 20, with, with girls in 22 countries. 
And they were looking at how vulnerable do girls feel when they're on online platforms like Facebook and Instagram. And 70 to 80 percent of girls mentioned that they, they get harassed, they get bullied, uh, they feel threatened. Um, they, they're not comfortable being on these platforms, but it's part because it's, it's natural to them. They have to be on these platforms. So what uh, uh, Plan did was that they very intelligent came up with a campaign um, and they brought in Facebook into that conversation, they literally dragged them into the conversation. And once that happened, Facebook took notice, their senior people said, all right, let's have a conversation around what are the issues. And now they have formed a complete group where they are now looking at how Facebook could be girls friendly and, and, and ensure that safety that they weren't being able to do before. So that shows you the power of bringing in these big brands in the conversation, which might not have been done in, in the past. So I think all these platforms have a good side to it as well, like Facebook for good is geared towards nonprofits. So they help nonprofits effectively communicate their message and use the data points that they have. Uh, LinkedIn has their own social impact stuff. Um, I think so I, if you can engage with them on a meaningful conversation um, and, and understand the power of what these platforms offer, I think there's a lot of good that you could definitely do with them. Uh, uh, Rahil, those, all those three examples is just just really fantastic. I mean, the, that's very real and and, and reaching uh, audiences that that were you know not accessible before, right? So that that that's really really uh, very special. Thanks for that, um, uh, guys. Before we uh, you know continue to the to uh, the latter part of this, I just want to make sure that folks who are listening in, please feel free to uh, throw in some questions while we have these. Uh, uh, social media Jedi Masters online with us. Uh, we don't have them for much longer, but uh, please, uh, you know, do uh, do chip in with any questions, uh, comments, and you know, obviously we'll 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 uh, throw it at them uh, as as they come up. Um, so um, again, uh, Ru, I'd like to go back to the the um, uh, the history example that you were talking about, right? So you know. I've studied that Sri Lankan history. It's, you know, it's, it's textbooks that haven't changed since since the 1960s. You know, history has you know in the textbooks don't go beyond 1977, right? All the new stuff is not covered. All the crazy history. Um, so, are you finding this is a way to change that? You know, now information is a commodity, right? I mean, you know, our, our textbooks are really just outdated. They don't they don't tell you the truth. They don't tell it to you in an interesting way. Are you using social media through this project to really, really change that and perhaps have a more in-depth and meaningful discussion about, you know, our, our troubled history in, in Sri Lanka, for example? Uh, yeah, I think you, you know, I should ask you to, to promote it for me because that's exactly the reason that we started. So one, you know, one is um, history in Sri Lanka is contained in dusty old textbooks and uh, it's confined really to that and it really doesn't, it's not relevant to anyone. It's not relevant to me walking around today, you know, unless I go in and I and I ask one of my younger cousins to show me, you know, their textbooks, I really can't access uh, history in a very meaningful way. Um, so I, it was really sort of three things. So it's one is certainly that it's that real lack. And then I actually got really inspired by Steela. So, you know, I was part of Steela 7, uh, you know, in January when we were working through, um, you know, our different groups. I, I know that, you know, when COVID hit, one of the things that I absolutely wanted to do was act on a passion project. You know, I've been working, uh, you know, doing the 95 for so long. So this was a passion project. And it was really a confluence of things. It was COVID. It was bringing that discussion online. It was also knowing that, um, you know, I wanted to bring content from the global south. So really, uh, you know, bring people of color stories out into a world where we can digest it, we can we can put it on a platform for digital natives um, who are very comfortable learning things online. Um, so we're really inspired by YouTube channels like Extra History, Oversimplified, uh, Kurtz, Kassad, you know, people who are just really producing high quality content online. Having said that, um, you know, I, I, I talked about him being a minefield earlier, and Sri Lanka is, 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 I mean, just like the rest of South Asia and Southeast Asia, is incredibly complicated. You know, we've got so many tribes, so many factions, um, so many kinds of divides. So I did have this utopian view that this is going to be, you know, a revelation for, for everybody. You know, so I, I was a bit, perhaps a little, um, you know, a bit idealistic at that point, thinking this is going to be a revelation of our identity and really a forum to discuss 
um, you know, what what really being Sri Lankan means, because it means so many different things to different people. You know, people, you know, you and I are probably have had so many different experiences of what our identity is. Um, inevitably, you know, we did. What, so, so, you know, when you ask the question, you know, are we are we living in a world where social media is no longer going to be considered a force for good? I, I have to say that I don't agree with it. Um, I am still very optimistic about you know using social media as a force for good because what I have found and what I've discovered through the community that we've created is is people who are really like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, you know, I've, we've confronted them with really lesser known stories of Sri Lankan history, perhaps picked a little bit, you know, and demonstrated that, hey, you know, the good guys weren't always the good guys. The bad guys aren't always the bad guys. And we've really put, we've really revealed motives and we're trying to do that, you know, bit by bit as we kind of uncover through our stories. And, and you know, it's the comment section is actually quite fascinating because a lot of people are like, I didn't know that. And then, you know, someone actually said, hey, thank you for, for, for telling me about my long, deeply held racist beliefs. And I, I couldn't actually believe that's a comment on social media because people usually take stands and stick to them quite quite hard. But I discovered that, you know, we found a community of people who are curious and who are willing to discover and are open-minded. Um, I can't say that's everybody, but I am so hopeful that this is, um, you know, that this and, and, and other platforms like it will attract and engage people who are just a little bit now, Living in a world where they're willing to 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 open up, debate, uh, and have a healthy discourse. Uh, and and, and uh, I must say, uh, Ru, uh, you know, y'all have you have done it uh, also in a very, again, an interesting, compelling, you know, uh, format. And and I'd I'd, uh, I'd uh, just ask you to type it in, you know, into the chat so that you know anybody's interested can can go check it out. It it really. Uh, really started something i think that uh, hopefully is a, is a movement uh we do have a, a question from uh, anun uh dawan someone we all know and love but uh, he's talking about saying hey you know what uh, facebook uh, australia you guys you guys heard about that right so uh, the australian government kind of uh, passed a law that said facebook's got to uh, you know charge or pay for news content right and they got to pay the big news houses and what does Facebook do? They immediately, you know, yank all that news content and, you know, prevent uh, Australians from, you know, from uh, sharing news content so that they don't have to pay, right? Whereas I think Google decided to negotiate and, you know, that Google's going one-on-one -on -one with each of these ho uh, news houses and negotiating uh, deals. Um, similarly, you know, uh, a few months back, you know, ostensibly the world's most powerful man with, uh, you know, he had a big bullhorn and that was yanked from him, right? So are we now in, a, in an era where, you know, you've got uh, social media elites now deciding, you know, who we can listen to, uh, what content we can see? Um, uh, Alok, are we just, you know, just ceding uh, control to another group of capitalists, uh, you know, or, 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 or control? So my take on this is a little different. And what I mean by that is that... Uh, we look at these uh, platforms as companies. I think gradually we'll realize that these are uh, these are social and national entities in itself. What I mean by that is that you may want to start engaging with the Facebook as a country of its own. You may want to engage with the Twitter as a country of its own. Uh, we define countries as natural boundaries because that's how we have been uh, attuned to. But I think those boundaries are changing. This whole social world, the way it has come about, is very different. So you could say Facebook is being high handed, saying that they want to take this away. The counter plea could be that Australia is kind of imposing a kind of uh, charge on them, which if this was a country, they would have been inter-country discussions to do something like that and not just a one-way charge being levied on them. So I think if you just look at uh, the whole economics of it, some of these platforms have uh, have revenue streams which are way higher than most of the country GDPs. Uh, and just looking at them saying this is a capitalist firm and that they need to abide by what the government's local government's uh, regulations are, we might be missing a trick there. We got to align ourselves to think that is where people want to be 
that is where money is that's where people are so if you were to look at the whole community that facebook has it has more people than any country's population so why should you look at it any different from that and i know this could be a a, a very different way of looking at it but to me it's not about them being capitalist it's about world realigning themselves to looking at some of these uh, platforms and companies differently uh, that's that's how i kind of look at it I look that that's really interesting because we were a little bit before we were talking about the blurring of uh, you know identity boundaries right and and now you're talking about actually really the blurring of uh, national boundaries uh, you know and then this idea of redefining you know uh, who you who and where you belong right and and uh, you know countries really needing to maybe rethink and readjust uh, to this to this new uh, new reality and you know maybe I can in the future consider myself a facebook patriot you know as as opposed to of those to Sri Lanka, a proud Sri Lankan, I guess. Um, uh, from uh, Ruba, um, um, uh, question on, you know, and as I'm monitoring the chat as well, I can see people already trying to figure out this clubhouse thing and and a and couple of our more uh, advanced members saying, hey, you know what, come and, you know, I'll, I'll send you an invite. Um, but uh, Ruba's uh, question really is, you know, just as you're starting to get used to something, you're getting comfortable, you know, you've got this next platform, this next thing that, yeah, you know, so are we just destined to keep chasing, you know, the next uh, platform that catches, you know, the, the trend, um, you know, any any guidance on saying, you know, do we do we insist and stick to a few till, you know, till our grandmother shows up on it and then we move on, you know, what, 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 what should we be doing? I can. Yeah, Meta, please. Um, I mean, I think, well, two quick things. One, is social media good? Is it a good or evil? And then I'm going to address this. I think the question of if it's used for good or evil, if it's good or evil, is a bit of a dated question. I think it's more how do we use it for whatever purposes. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying, you know, cars do they pollute are they bad or good? Now it's like, how do we use it? Well, what do we do with it? It's, it's so, so looking at it into, um, how do we use it? Well, then a platform is just another tool. It's kind of like outfits. Uh, it's like um, almost like think of it as like stores. You know, you don't have to shop at every single store that shows up. You know, like a new one shows up in the blog. Maybe you go in, you check it out, you try on some clothes, see who else is going there. If it suits your style, you like the other people, go, you hang out. If you don't, you don't go. So it's less about should we keep up with everything, but more am I in a constant learning in growth mindset? And we you know in, in Sila and all the networks, one of the things that makes it so special is we we think of ourselves or we, we are here today because we all have, you know, as Bill says, broad curiosity and we have a desire to keep learning. We're not committed to everything. I, I think this pressure to feel like we have to catch up um, may be disempowering rather than asking which of these platforms fits me and then right. lean in and then ask how should I uh, behave in this context and how should I act in order to achieve whatever it is that I want to achieve which we hope is for good so so hopefully that kind of addresses the approach it's not the platforms it's sort of our mindset towards how we interact with them and how we lead ourselves through them yeah no, that, uh, that, that's not really helpful, my boss. Thank you. Um, Alok, did you, were you going to say something on that? No, I was, I, was, I was just going to say it's like when we were reading books. You would read a fiction, you would read a biography, you would read all types of books, right? So it's what suits your taste. Uh, it's just that because this is new, we tend to potentially overthink some of these pieces. Whatever yeah. works uh, is, is what you, what's natural to you is what you need to be doing. Um, great, yeah. thanks for that. Uh, yeah, Rahil. Uh, just, just to add to that, I think you also need to understand like why are you in social, on, on social media platforms in, in the first place? You know, What's your big purpose? Is it to socialize? Is it to network? So I think now there's a lot of specialization within each platform. So if you're really looking for networking, um, you know, connections, uh, building on things that you're trying to do, new ventures, new opportunities, then things like LinkedIn work for you best. But Facebook has a different, so I think every platform has their own need and you need to determine that. At the end, there are only one or two that you could really give your mindful time to. The rest just becomes, you know, good to have apps that you just might look into when you when you need to. Got it, right. 
Um, guys, I'm going to ask you just a final round, um, really just more from a uh, sense of how do you, you know, uh, just tips, advice uh, that you can leave behind for us in terms of, you know, how people can overcome some of these concerns, fears. You guys were already starting to touch on this, but I'd like almost, you know, sort of uh, uh, that, that Jedi wisdom to be rounded up in this last few minutes. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps each of you can and can leave us with uh, a sense of, you know, how you would uh, uh, help help us navigate this turbulence. Sure. So. Sure. So. Shall I go? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So I would say social media rules are the same rules as life rules, um, with a few caveats. So the first I would say is you know you know you're being watched, so don't expose yourself too much. I would say that's you know the first thing. So if you know that you've got your curtains open, you're going to be careful about you know what you're wearing, right? So that's the first thing. And the other is don't you know write anything or do anything that you wouldn't you know, say to your grandmother's face, basically, you know, so I, I would say, just try and try and be kind and be good. And then also try not to be an evil megalomaniac. I would say those are sort of the three rules that I would have for social media. Perfect. Great. Who's next? Uh, Rahil? Yeah, so I'll go next. Um, so I, I think there are a few things we need to understand fundamentally. What social and digital offer you is scale, is the ability to reach specific people with specific um, uh, you know, insights or, or, or information. Um, it's a place where you can have meaningful conversations at the same time. And understanding that I think is very important. And then also understanding how do you leverage these platforms? We need to realize that since they're AI driven, every platform has their own unique way of maximizing the reach of their posts or engaging people. And I think it's, it's time that we need to accept that this is the new world. Um, the later we join the club, um, you know, the, the, the more we're going to miss out on opportunities. So I think navigating in that space, there are certain things I would just want to recommend. Like uh, there's a guy called Nir Ayal. He came up with this book called Booked, um, which all digital platforms use religiously to hook people, to hook us. Um, he's a behavior designer. But now he's also come up with a book called Indistractable, which talks about how do you detox or uh, separate yourself from, from this the digital uh, you know, ecosystem that's out there. And, um, and he's got some really good blogs around um, focus and you know, dividing and how do you, you know, keep yourself focused on, on, on the work that you're doing. So I think things like these would really be helpful. I can share those links. Um, there's another guy called BJ Fogg, who's the, the godfather of behavior design, the Stanford professor. He's got some very good resources on tiny habits, on how you form habits and how could you form good habits, like when, you know, again, detox yourself around that. Um, and I think the last thing I would just say is that we really need to understand what AI means to our work, to our personal life, and to our business. And um, there's a great book I want to recommend, which is called Competing in the Age of AI, which really talks about understanding what AI would mean in the next 5, 10, 15 years, uh, and, and how do you leverage that. Um, so some of the resources I, I can put in the chat box, but um, yeah, that's my take on it. Great. Uh, thanks, Rahil. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, Meta, any uh, any parting words for us? Um, yes, I think uh, one thing to keep note of social media, it, it can be overwhelming. The human brain, we're just, we the, with everything I've said about lean in and do your thing, just to be very cognizant um, of two things. One is personal responsibility and just it's, um, it's our own decision of how we want to interact and just always be very cognizant if we're acting or reacting to something in front of us. Uh, there is a point, the difference between where something is healthy versus eating versus overeating is a matter of dosage. Like poison is a matter of, if medicine can become poison. What is true to Ruba's point is the human brain has not evolved to absorb this much information so fast. It's one thing to have and then this is the thing for kids and youth, which is a whole different conversation. It's one thing if you're 13 and you have like three people telling you what they think of you. It's a whole other thing when you have a thousand people telling you things. Uh, it's one thing if two people tell you information about some rumors they've heard, true or false, but somehow a hundred people are saying it, you automatically think it's true. Our brains are not wired to contain this much input. So it becomes much more important that we assess how we find ourselves reacting. Are we being emotionally triggered? Are we mm. feeling anger? Are we feeling hate and lean into that? So it almost like, it's it's almost like a trigger for an improved mindfulness practice in that sense, yeah. because 
we do have to manage just the sheer quantity, uh, just quantity. And and if we feel overwhelmed, just to realize it's okay as a species, we were not evolved to, to take all the this stuff right. in our face all at once. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I like the uh, closing word from uh, the cold held and <laughs> You know, after weighing all the pros and cons, it eventually comes down to what my personal ethics and uh, individual leadership is. Because you're, you're working with a medium that is not uh, controlled as of now. So you could go either way with it. Uh, is the medium bad? I'm not sure. I think we are the medium. I think collectively what we are putting in there, what we are contributing is what the medium is. Uh, the medium behaves according to what we put in uh, and how we operate in that. So if all of us collectively are putting in nicer, better, kinder, positive uh, ideas uh, and thoughts into it, we would have a more positive medium coming out of it. Comes down to a uh, personal value system and that's what's driving the medium as we go forward. To that extent, I think it's very similar to what uh, I learned in my SILA one, that it comes down to personally how I want to uh, run my leadership style and what I want to contribute to the medium, honestly. Alok, thanks for, thanks for finishing with that thought and then kind of bringing us back to really, at the end of the day, what you guys are saying, and it's, it's that SILA ethos uh, that's going to help us navigate uh, navigate the turbulence and, and uh, find... Uh, find the balance in the force, right? Thank you so much, all of you, for being part of this uh, and sharing your insights and, and real-world experiences. Take care, guys. And now we're going to slowly hand back to Adam and Aisha. I'm going to introduce the next section of our program. The two sessions are given by what we call our what two of our greatest SELA stars, Kumu and Farhat. Kumudini will be meeting a session on using the hidden strength of your voice effectively. Kumudini is a voice trainer. She's a choral director and a business consultant and artiste. She has a very eclectic and academic professional background. I know she does consumer insights, business management, uh, strategic consultancy, information technology, psychology. Uh, she's also uh, a passionate advocate for child rights and mental health. And she's uh, conducted multiple awareness campaigns and talks at schools, youth centers in Sri Lanka. That's Kumudini's section. Farhad Karamali's section, our Pakistani trainer extraordinaire, he is going to talk about challenging imagination because we all are taught to challenge the status quo, but what are those interior, interior blocks that stop us from experimenting and dancing to the tune of our inner voice? Uh, so in the session, we will learn to challenge our imaginations. However, there's a note that I have from Farhad, which is join only if you are willing to break free from conformity. Beware, conformists are allergic to challenging imagination. And we care for our people. That is why the thought leader. Compassion is a topic which... Let me start off by saying thank you for having me as a speaker. I am beyond honored. I am at the Dilma Kila. So I know people, we don't actually have a tea break or coffee break, but I thought I might as well move to a location where I can have my tea and coffee. So this is where I am broadcasting from. I also have a cocktail and water right so i'm going to start off right um i've been studying voice and well the use of voice primarily as a singer but i have been looking at and over the past few years actually been looking at the importance of um voice and how much we take it for granted now, if you think about it, we all use our voices every day and you might be asking, okay, what else is there to learn about 
uh, our voice if we are not singing if we are speaking properly then i mean then we are we are doing the we are, we are getting the job done however there are few things about how you use your voice and how you support your voice that helps with how you get across you know, especially in the online uh, the platform era that we are in right now um we are missing the very important um this is the, the very important aspect of body language uh, of, of feeling the person's energy live you can't you, without an extra effort you can't really convey that over on an online platform oh super right i will thank you all i will get you online in a few minutes as in on stage in a few minutes right so one of the things that i want you all to understand i'm going to demonstrate something about uh speech okay and i'm going to talk you through a few things about your speaking voice now um i don't know if they all know this bobby hopefully you might your speaking voice is actually about four to five notes above your the lowest note that you can hit right on your on your singing scale or the register that your voice is on it is um yes you know uh it's actually four to five notes above your speaking voice is four to five notes about about your lowest note so which essentially means that your speaking voice is resonating in your chest it is in your thoracic cavity that your speaking voice uh oh, the it's essentially your speaking voice is resonating in your chest right now there are two resonance chambers that we have we have the chest uh and the head and you would have heard this phrase um if any of you have been around singers you would have heard the phrase chest voice and head voice that's actually what it means your voice is either resonating in your chest so if you when you're speaking if you speak your name you keep your hand on your chest and speak you will feel the vibration here right so it means your voice is now in your lower register or when you go up a uh, high in the upper register the voice is no longer resonating in here because it will start resonating in your head the 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 closest uh, space of resonance for your higher voice is your head right so if you keep your if you go higher up and you keep your hand on your forehead you'll feel your voice resonating up there what chest voice and head voice means okay right now i'm also going to demonstrate a few things i wonder if i should add people on okay i'm who would like to join uh bobby i am pulling you up who else ashok shall i pull you hello bobby me my wingman <laughs> oh, okay. hi hi i don't right. know if i volunteered for this or not but here i am <laughs> I, i did i think i pulled you in any way willy nilly i apologize but here you are okay i'm going to ask you to um when you're speaking right i'm going to show you what actually no can you just tell me your names just pronounce your names for me me sutterfield all righty bobby henebry all right okay right now okay i'm going to demonstrate the two ways that we generally speak or the normal way where we we generally speak is this so if i am speaking without making an effort to articulate this is what i sound like right and this is this is my normal way of speaking and if you see my muscles on my face relaxed and i'm not actually projecting a whole thing right and also i'm going to give you a side view of my speaking right i am now I'm still speaking in my But this is not normal for me anymore. I don't speak with the same as I actually have to make an effort. But this is how it looks like when my I'm relaxed. I'm a relaxed speaker at the moment. And then 
when I start articulating, or as I call it hyper articulation, because I want to emphasize that we are um, putting more effort than we generally do when we speak. Okay, so if you see, I am now hyper articulating. You can see how much more uh, my the muscles in my face are moving, right? And so there's, there are two things that's happening. One, I am actively engaging my cheek muscles and keeping them lifted. And the other is I'm using my jaw a lot more. You can see how much more uh, animated my face is. This is actually uh, um, something that we take for granted. We do not articulate properly. So the gentleman, can I ask you to do something a little odd for me? Uh, can you? Do make these faces. I'm going to get you out to exercise your face muscles. Okay, so do this. Mm -hmm. Right, and do this also. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. ah. Very good. Again. Okay. Ah. Ah. Very good. Okay. You that. <laughs> You would have felt a lot of muscles in your face that you haven't actually used in a while. Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to actively, actively smile. So by smiling, when you smile, the cheek, the cheek muscles lift, right? Keep the smile and um, overuse your jaw and now say your name again, please. Mead. Sutterfield. There you go. Bobby. Bonnie Hennebry. All I feel right. like this is uh, Christmas and a photo. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so that was actually the first thing that I wanted you all to understand about. Um, understand about how we can use the face muscles. We do not use our facial muscles a lot when we do so. Uh, one, um, an exercise I'm going to teach you all about um, how to get your jaw engaged. You can put your finger behind your ear, especially when you're singing. If you can put your finger behind your ear and drop your jaw. There you go. Now, close your mouth, but keep the, keep the hole that you feel behind your ear open. There you go. Now try speaking your name, please. Keep the cheek. Mama. First, Bobby. Bobby Hennebry. Very good. Meet? Meet Sutterfield. Okay. Meet, yeah, I don't know if you all heard, but your voices actually, the the resin, the sorry, the frequency that it hit, the voices are actually lower. The lower face. So what's what what I'm getting you to do by keeping this space open is getting you to open your trachea up a lot more. So there's a lot more frequency. There's more space in your trachea for the lower frequencies of your voice to bounce around, get the momentum and come out with the rest of it. How many of you knew that we create more than one frequency when we make any sound with our larynx? Yay. Thank you, Bobby. There's a whole <laughs> spectrum of it. Right? Yeah, it's it amazing. Is. Like how it many is. different tones and overtones. It is, it is. So, I mean, let me demonstrate a very, very simple uh, explanation and I, this is something that I don't understand when people don't do this. The difference between the contemporary styles and the classical styles. So um, I'm going to demonstrate. Give me a phrase of a song, gents. Actually, I'm going to get. I'm going to demonstrate and I'm going to ask you all to do it also if you don't mind. Um, I'm a I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. Okay. I, all righty. I don't know what that is. What is that? It's an insight. It's, a, it's the Georgia Tech spite. Yeah, it's what, what you... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to, on the street where you live. Hopefully both of you have watched my fair lady. On the street where you live. Yes. Okay. Just that one. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate. Um, and this is the contemporary voice. On the street where you live. And the classical voice is where I am pressing my thyroid shield down and I'm going to keep it depressed down. 
on the street where you live. Right? That is the fundamental difference between your contemporary voice and your classical voice. That that the the, the placement of your thyroid shield. Uh, right. Okay. Bye. Gentlemen, uh, just so you Bobby, I'm pretty sure you've done this before. You know how to depress your thyroid shield, right? Yeah, I think of it in terms of how I'm in my diaphragm or not yes. is how I oh. think of it. Yes, that is so that that's the, the various schools of thought have different ways of describing it, but that is actually the what scientifically what happens is the thyroid shield gets depressed and gets held down. So I'm going to show you how to identify where your thyroid shield is. Can you yawn for me? Oh. Oh. There you go. Right? And you feel the back of your throat opening? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Now yawn again and keep the back of the throat open. Right. Now try singing. Okay, so that's your that's how you identify your thyroid shield and keep it down. First of all, let's do the contemporary. I will give you the starting note. Bobby, actually, can you sing the starting note so that it's in your register? On, on, on the street where you live. Nice. Need, can you try? On the street where you live. Oh, my goodness. The resonance, gentlemen, that's beautiful. Now, can we try going back to just singing, uh, bring this back to neutral and relax and try singing the same phrase. On the street where you live, try. On the street where you live. Right. Bobby? You want me to do this in normal talking, relax? Yes. That kind of yes. Way? Yes, On yes. On the street where you live. And there you go. That's the difference between your classical voice and your contemporary voice. Okay, so now you can apply the same thing when you are speaking online. So if in case you find that you sound too um, flat, if you, if you think that you, are, you, are, you, sound, you sound childish, these are some of the comments that I get when I am working with my coaches or the professional speakers that I have. They they tell me that the comments they get that they sound like an old lady or they sound uh, childish. People think that they sound rude. So the way to modulate voice, but to how long can we typically hold a classical voice in a session? Uh, it depends on so the practice urge. The practice of holding it down is what is important. You you build muscle memory with practice. And then once it comes to that point, you don't need to think about it anymore. This is this is actually what practice is for, to build the muscle memory to do so. Um, yes, sorry, Bobby. Go ahead. May I share just a quick personal anecdote on that? Yeah, of course. Um, I had I had throat pain in college because I used to talk so much up here and stay so tense. Yes. I actually went to a speech pathologist and they yes. did the stroboscopy and show you know your vocal folds and kind of it was if they're and and what i found when i when i started doing voice lessons i started as i said uh, more thinking through my diaphragm yes. Yes. and accessing my diaphragm and that actually made me a better speaker with less pain because i didn't realize i was actually speaking and conversing in an unhealthy way Absolutely. outside of my normal unhealthy stupid comments i make i'm just talking about the <laughs> physicality of speaking to your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, right. But uh, <laughs> sorry. the other thing also is something that I would like you all to uh, understand. So when we start speaking, we actually don't get a lot of education on how to speak. We do. We it's a it's primarily an um, act of imitation. We are in, imitating what we hear around us. Right. So also the language that you are making your sounds in has a huge impact on how you speak or how you make your sounds across the board no matter what your sounds are no matter what sounds you are making because you are developing a set of um your muscles are, are developed according to what you practice constantly so if you are practicing speaking in english 
uh, or whatever language constantly, then your muscles are going to be formed that way. The muscle memory gets formed that way. So when we are trying to make sounds in another language, for instance, the, we are trying to do it with the muscles that are used to making sounds in a particular way. So this plus the how we develop our hearing, we have uh, how we remember our sounds is also very important. If we are surrounded by a particular pattern of sound, that is what we are going to follow. Because as humans, that's how we've learned to create sound. We've learned to create sound by imitating what's around us. Right? Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to ask uh, if Ashok and Mitchell, oh, sorry, Ashok and uh, Hariharan would like to come on stage. Shall I do that? Thank you very much for volunteering, gents. Right. Ashok. Hi. Hi, Ashok. Where's Hi? Uh, I don't know why is my camera not getting on. Oh, very welcome, Bobby. Thank you for coming on stage. And thank you for being my <laughs> guinea pig. <laughs> All right. I am now going to make Ashok my guinea pig. And I have lost Hari. Oh, dear. Who's the other one? Hi, <laughs> Right now, Ashok, uh, yeah. I am, your camera is not working. I, I don't know why it is not showing. Uh, okay. It was working fine. I had given the permission also. Okay, uh, that's all right. So then I'm going to then work with you only by listening to your voice. Yeah? Okay. 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 Ashok, that, could you um, say your name for me, please? Ashok. Uh, the full name. Okay. So Ashok me. Mittal. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you to try to um, use your... Remember the exercise that I showed um, what Bobby need to do? Can you do that for me? The um, um, very good again. Um, um, right, and I'm going to ask you to do one additional thing. Um, I'm going to ask you to move your jaw in a circle. It's like chewing a card. Uh -huh. And the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to uh, meow for me. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Can you keep your hand on your forehead here? Just uh, just above your, in the middle. Right, and meow for me. Do yeah. you know? yeah. Very good, do you feel the resonation? Yes. Uh, very good. Okay, now I want you to say your name again and make sure you can feel the vibration in your forehead. Okay? Right. I want you to use your lips and your jaw and bring the word, the letters K and M forward more. Ashok. Ashok. Very good. Okay, how did that feel? So I could feel the sensation. Very good. Yeah. Did you hear the difference in your voice when you I, uh, focused on where you were placing your voice? That's right. I could feel the difference. Yes, that is. So again, that is actually what I want to um, iterate here, guys, is that if the, the head and the chest, you are, there is something called voice placement um that you need to do yes bobby the meow is um actually something that i use with my students to help them find their voice in their mask so because the meow actually forces you to get send your voice through your nose right and something that we there's a huge difference and something we constantly uh, forget is your nasal passage is part of your resonance chambers Right? So when you keep your finger here and then you meow and you get them, also this helps my students find their high voices. 
when they can't move past the speaking voice and they don't know how to get to a high pitch, you ask them to imitate a kitten and go, um, Ashok, would you like to try? Sure. Keep your finger here and your highest, the highest, uh, as in the kitten sound. Think of a kitten and go, meow. Very good. Now, I'm going to tell you that that is your, in your higher register of your singing voice. You can actually sing all the way up to there. Wow. <laughs> Do you generally sing? I have never sung. Well, you can sing. Right? Okay. Just I thought I'd be thrown out of the house if I tried to like that. No, 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 no. <laughs> See, the difference is, um, and this is something that um, we forget and we don't train. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, you can sing. Yes, yes, Raj, absolutely. <laughs> the, the difference is, right, the singing uh, or getting someone to sing is actually more about training your mind than training your voice. Your voice will do what your mind tells it to. So if your sure. mind tells you that you can't sing, you're not going to sing. Very right? interesting. But, but by I'm just listening to you and I can tell you that you can sing and I can get you to sing within like an hour, I'll be able to get you to sing. So I'm going to try that, Kumu. I'm going to take you <laughs> on that one. All right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because I've done this with so many uh, it's about getting people past the mental blocks. We, a lot of us have mental blocks when it comes to our voices. Uh, we've either been told that we can't sing or we've been told that we um, sound horrible or we have tried to sing along with something and we haven't done that. Uh, as in, we've tried to sing along with something and we've failed. We didn't meet our expectations and afterwards we decide we are not going to sing again. We're not going to try again. But the very important step that you missed out there is that you need to try and sing in your head first, not with your voice. So you need to imagine singing the song, imagine your voice and align your mental voice with the reference sound. Then after about two or three tries of doing that, you will sing. Your voice will pitch the notes. It is happened. I'm taking you on that one. All righty. <laughs> that is fantastic. So I will see you in my well after yes. whenever after my yes. <laughs> I will I will get in touch with you and we'll start that. Right. Uh, I am wondering whether uh, Ayesha, I do you um, should I be asking people to join the stage now or do I have time for more? And do you have any questions? Superb, I have time for more. Do you all have any questions? Ashok, do you have any questions? Uh, Kumadi, I am going to get in touch with you. Okay, and right. I'm surely going to try it out. Uh, I think you make you you made a few important things that I really want to experience. Uh, and Super. we are going to do that. We're going to Super. get it over. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna let you go, Ashok, because other you'll be on the stage. Right. Please. All yeah. right, brilliant. Okay, now are there any questions from people who are watching, listening? Uh, etc. Or would you like to come up and try some of the, um, I can try and help you figure out how to use your voice a little bit more effectively. I'm sure all of you are, Aj! I'm pulling you up, Aj. there you are. Where? Aj is a bit. Aj, ah, there you are. Hello, Aj. Hey, Kumu, can you hear me? <laughs> I can. But I you can't, can't see, see me. Ah, there, oh, you. there you go. There you All go. right. And I see you have gotten rid of Veda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been interesting. To sing through that, yes. <laughs> or to speak through that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, thank you, Alok. I, I agree. I agree with Alok. Yes. <laughs> okay. Aj, yeah. um, I would like you to... Okay. I know you sing. You have sung before and I have heard you. Yes. But I... I'm not trained. I, you're not trained? <laughs> well, okay. But... But from what I've heard of you, you uh, always I've always heard that you and you're a bass, which means you are you're you're comfortable more in your lower register. And the um, instinctive thing that we do when we are going into our lower notes or our higher notes is to to depress our thyroid shield. So I have a feeling that you are constantly depressing your thyroid shield. You ask me. Whether it takes effort, mm. that is generally mm. how you speak. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to ask you to uh, sing the same thing on the street where you live. Very, very simple. Can you do that for me? Just regular, right? Just regular. On the street where you live. Ah, very good. Okay. So now you made an effort to keep it regular there. Yeah. 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 Okay, now I'm going to ask you to sing it where you normally sing it. Okay. On the street where you live. Yeah, you would have felt the difference if you okay? yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have pressed down. There you go. So for you, you actually don't need to make an effort. That is how you, that is instinctively what you reach for. So you are, your instinctive style is classical. Okay. And you sing And then to go up, Kumu, then you're saying like if, you know, for whatever, just to try and get to a high note for yeah. some something more for, yeah. So now I'm going to, I'm actually going to tell you all this. Gentlemen actually have uh, an advantage in the singing world over females because you all have the access to the lower registers, like octave one, two, uh, but you can also hit the female registers. Now, um, the highest note sung so far the people who hold the record for it are guys the two guys who then they, they sing off the keyboard on the uh on the upper scale right so it is actually you can try again to try to reach or to discover what your high voice is just mew like a, as a kitten and make it as horrible sounding as there you go that is your oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Wow. I'm sorry about that. wow. Okay. That okay. is actually your top okay. note. Okay. So you can okay. hit up to there, and that was a full resonant uh, sound in your head. So if you sing yeah. falsetto, now the difference between head voice and falsetto is this, right? Head voice is meow, is head voice, or ah, is is resonant. It has depth. But falsetto is where you're doing it without supporting it with your uh, diaphragm. So, is falsetto, right? It has, you, you take the power out of it completely. So if you move into falsetto, you actually might be able to go higher even, or even with your head voice. It depends on how you aim for it. But there's a whole, you have quite a huge range there. Say about four octaves. Wow. <laughs> still, still more to discover. That's great. Glad to hear that. Um, yes. uh, oh, uh, David, sorry, I, I just noted David is asking a question about some like ah. exercises to prep. Maybe I think you were going to anyway, share some of that. So, yes, but, of course. Yeah. Nice. All right. Let me, let me get off. Uh, let me get off stage. Thanks, Kumu. All right. Right. So, the exercises that you I can provide, and this is for across the board to. Um, these exercises are very simple. They require you to sound a little odd, but it's okay. Nothing's going to happen to you. You can do it in, your, in the toilet, so it's okay. Right? This is called the lip trill. You start from your lowest note that you can hit, and go up to the highest note that you can hit, and then go back down. Right? Uh, for those of you who want to know how to do that, you purse your lips, right? Don't press them together too hard. Just purse them together and blow through it. Like a horse. 
Right? You do that first and then while doing that, you make a sound. So it comes out as Oh, they're used to it. They're used to this because I come here and teach Mobi. I teach my students as well here. They're very used to this. Right, the next is the tongue trip. Right, those are two, the two exercises that I can tell you without a doubt will help you with your breathing, will help you uh, identify your diaphragm, how to use it properly to support your voice. And um, this will exercise your vocal range and your articulators because you're using your lips and your tongue, right? So it's a, it's a very, very effective exercise for a lot of things, especially for anyone who wants to speak, if you're going to speak for a long time or if you're going to sing, both of these are fantastic. Um, there is also a bunch of tongue twisters that I give out my students, give out to my students that help them to identify and use the face muscles. One thing that I will tell you in the morning, if you can do this along with anything else that you do, exercise your face, facial muscles as well. So that as many weird faces as you can make would be fantastic because it will stretch your face, face muscles, facial muscles out quite well. Then you also need to work your jaw, which is that and the other way. Right? And your tongue, the tongue needs to get exercise. I am going to uh, add a disclaimer here, well, not a disclaimer, but I'm going to uh, recognize this because my sister actually said this to me. Actually, no, I'm not good. Never mind. You will see what I'm talking about when I do it. These are the tongue exercises. So, in, out, that. As fast as you can do it would be good, but if you don't want to do it too fast, just in and out, right? Then there is side to side. Again, uh, faster the better, but try start doing it slowly. Then around the lips. <laughs> right? That is another one. That's to exercise the tongue. And mind you, your tongue is the strongest muscle in your body. Just letting you know. And then there is this exercise. It's to uh, tense the tip of the tongue. Uh, and then tense the two sides. And that is to improve agility of the tongue and for you to identify how to isolate muscles on your tongue. Now muscle isolation is actually very very important when it comes to voice work. Um, for that matter the curriculum that I'm developing has a lot of mindfulness uh, exercises involved because it is as I said essentially an act of the mind. It is how well you um, think through how to use your tools. So your voice, the human voice is the most uh, complex instrument in the world. And it's capable of creating a number, a whole plethora of uh, sounds. I, I think I am, I have taken up quite a lot of time. Ayesha, should I keep going? There's a lot more I can talk about. Okay, superb. All right. Okay, so since I have time, I am now going to talk you through how the voice actually works. I'm going to do this uh, really fast. Usually this takes about an, uh, okay, 10 minutes is fantastic. I'm going to, this usually takes about an hour for me to uh, get my students to them and the, the, to feel the effects and etc. But I'm going to do it really fast. The five components that uh, work to produce your sound is first the lungs. Second is your larynx. Third is the epiglottis. I will explain all of this in a bit. Fourth is your 
vocal voice uh, chamber or the resonance chamber or the voice tract it's called a lot of things the fifth is the articulators okay so i'm going to start go, go from one to the other the first the lungs are controlled by your diaphragm right your lungs sit inside the rib cage and your rib cage is generally at a state of neutral we do not generally move uh, require the full use of our lungs most of our lives we will do something called a surface breath where only a portion of our lungs uh, are used the the area on top is what is used predominantly and the the problem with that when we are trying to make sounds is that because we are so used to creating um, breathing only from here we try to sustain our sounds with a surface breath and that's where a lot of the problems uh, come out right so to actually engage your full lungs you need to engage your diaphragm and breathe completely so that the rib cage actually opens the diaphragm connects your last set of ribs so when the diaphragm is engaged it automatically opens the rib cage out which allows the lungs to fill up more so if you actually want to understand how to breathe better keep your hand just beneath your solar plex here engage focus on your diaphragm and breathe keep the diaphragm engaged and breathe and you feel a full breath your dorsal muscles will actually expand right and that is not a full breath but about 3/4 of your lungs you are using that for a full amount for the full um, lungs to be used you need to relax this because the lungs come all the way up to here right so that's the lungs then we have the larynx the larynx also called the vocal vocal cords voice box uh they are actually vocal folds they are folds that when the air pushes through them they start vibrating and creates frequencies and that is the frequencies that bobby was talking about as well there are a bunch of frequencies that we create when the when the vocal folds start vibrating but the the pitch the frequency that is used the loudest one is called the fundamental pitch and that is what our voice is generally um play stop moving along you have your epiglottis the epiglottis is the gatekeeper of your respiratory tract it is a valve that closes when we swallow so it keeps anything but air from going into it um the epiglottis has a important function when it comes to making sound it it uh, acts in um collaboration with the lungs to provide additional pressure for the hard consonants that we use in whatever language that we're talking about now in english we only have k g and h as the hard consonants or guttural consonants they are they are formed deep inside by our with our soft palate k g and h if you want to make the sounds you'll actually feel the resonation at the back here right so it requires additional air support for the sounds to come out now languages that use other guttural sounds other than the k g and h will actually have better muscle um, usage than the native english speakers or speakers of softer languages right okay moving along you have the voice the vocal tract now interestingly the voice tract i'm going to demonstrate with something like this the tubes and there it's not one tube it's a bunch of tubes that each has a resonating frequency i don't know whether you can hear this but when you tap these any object actually every object has its own resonating frequency and our vo the voice tract muscles have the same now what happens the voice tract shapes according to the vowel sounds that you are creating so there again we have muscle memory based on language because the vowels are dependent on the language that you are creating them along with that the shape they also will shape itself to resonate with the frequency created by our larynx right so if you want to experiment close your eyes and do ah you will feel the muscles at the back of your throat moving up and down right so that is your voice tract 
rearranging itself to resonate with the with the frequency created by your vocal cords and that is based on the, the vowel sounds that we have then you have your articulators your articulators are the cheek muscles lips teeth uh, tongue jaw lip uh, i said lips teeth tongue jaw hard palate here smooth palate it is technically part of the hard palate but i differentiate anyway smooth palate is the smooth arch behind the the top one and then the soft palate at the back and those the articulators are responsible for creating all the consonants that you use so using all of these articulators will actually help you clear clarify your sound a lot more that and then there is also the training of the mind and well there's a, there's a lot of things that your voice relies on it's not just the muscles that you use okay i am going to move you all towards the stage can you all please all leave here and go towards the stage yes aisha that is what i am supposed to do there you go 5 minutes to be on stage thank you very much all for joining i hope i didn't drown you all with my uh, speech hey, thank you for joining thank you bobby thank you Okay, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. As I said, I'm technically speaking to this green dot, which is right in front of my screen, on a subject which I am extremely, extremely, extremely passionate about. It's challenging imagination. Uh, challenging imagination is basically a program for. If it's a workshop that I do, it's twenty minutes, as we can see today, or it could be uh, a full day. It can be two days. I've also done three-day programs related to challenging imagination. Interestingly enough, one of my company values is also challenging imagination. Uh, and as Adam said in the beginning, um, it's very easy to challenge the status quo. Uh, however, it is more difficult to challenge imagination. And this particular program is for individuals, for businesses, for families, and for teams. So basically, it really doesn't make a difference who you are, what you do, which part of the world you come from, as long as you have a heart that beats, a mind that thinks. This one's for each one of you. And since we're doing it together, you know how important it is to have fun in the process. Uh, all of you want to have fun? A thumbs up would be great. I don't know if you can show me the thumbs up or no. A okay. Uh, you know, and, and feel free to add the emojis, the smiley faces, uh, hearts, the thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, I leave that over open to you. What I will be doing is, uh, I will be removing my slides, going back and forth. So we will try to do a lot of things in the limited time that we have. Uh, by the way, does everybody want to have fun? Uh, yes or that? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. I assume it's a yes. I can't see this uh, chat. Okay, let me move on. We hear a lot of words. Let me do a very quick build up, and I'll tell you what we eventually get out of the program after the little conversation. Uh, we keep on hearing a lot of words, and you've probably heard these words a number of times: renovate, right size, creativity, ten x thinking, um, Agile, and then you also have books called "Who Moved My Cheese," "Heart of Change." You think of game changers. Design thinking is required. Requires uh, challenging imagination. Blue ocean strategy requires challenging imagination. So these are a lot of words. At the end of the day, it boils down to simply speaking two things: transformation or change. This is basically what it is about. And if you've been listening to uh, the amazing panel we had a little while back with Arj. Uh, The Darth Vader leading the way with facts, figures, insights, amazing questions. Um, I, I noticed a lot of people, including myself, uh, joined Clubhouse. I've been hearing of Clubhouse, but eh, never really went there. Uh, but there was so much of encouragement that it actually got me to change, transform. Hopefully, now in the process of what happens. Moral of the story being, these are buzzwords, and more so now in the. Covid world or the pandemic hit world now, which I I prefer calling this a non-normal. You know, we've all heard new normal, and it's interesting why we call it the new normal. And I think I would invite you to reflect on why do we call it new normal. So, when you're looking at all of these words, we need to understand at the end of the day, it's about creating the personal aha. 
and challenging imagination is about that aha we basically create. So this program is actually about understanding four blocks that stop each one of us from moving forward, from experimenting, from discovering something that we haven't really thought about. From a world that, as Meta said, from uh, analog to digital, uh, the, the binary, the online and the offline, and so many other lines, and from uh, two social media um, platforms to multiple six or seven social media platforms. So basically, what is this all about? So challenging imagination is about generating the aha. I am sure each one of us over here has a lot of ahas that need to be materialized. You know, we keep on getting ideas all the time. Uh, do I have a yes or that on the chat? You can just write a yes or no, and I'll close the screen and I'll come back to the slide again. Do I have a yes on that? Uh, do you have a lot of ahas? Ideas that you look forward to? Yes, 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 yes. I anon, yes, anon says I yes, great stuff. So we all have a lot of ideas. Uh, it's interesting to note what actually stops us, and that is what my focus is. When my interest in the subject started off way back in 1999 when I was doing a project for Unilever. And uh, they said, listen, we want to come up with something which is truly transformation. We want to convert our ahas into results. And as a result of which, there was a lot of research I had to do, find out a lot of things. And I discovered interest. Uh, it is not so much about coming up with ideas, which is the challenge. It is what stops us from bringing those ideas to life, which need to be addressed. You can't control the flow of ideas. They happen all the time. They come in all the time. They are there everywhere. Uh, they can come up with the most weirdest of times sometimes. You know? Do you know what's the most common place to come up with ideas? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Where do you get the most natural flow of ideas? I mean, it's different for everybody, but there's some places common. Where do you get most of your ideas? When do you get most of your ideas? Chat, 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 chat. When do you get most of your ideas? When do you get most of in the restroom in the shower? Hi, Bill. Yes. Oh, okay. On the walk as well in the shower. <laughs> Toilets are genuinely great place for ideas because we are in such an amazing state of comfort, uh, not being bothered by what people would say, how I would be uh, judged, and we're just sitting and we, the flow of ideas. So, run it. Yes, <laughs> run it. Shower. You know, I generally get, I, I generally get ideas and I take showers. So I call it getting um, water on the brain. So, uh, you know, when I travel, so these are all moments. So, and you don't plan for these ideas. These ideas just come. However, there are blocks that stop us. Where do these blocks actually come from? These blocks primarily come from toilet moments. Better. <laughs> yes, toilet moments, the magical toilet moments, MTM. These are actually uh, what stops AHA from converting into results is synapses. Uh, this is the medical term. Some of you may be aware of it. I am not a medicine background. I'm finance and marketing working in HR, but uh, uh, synapses are basically, in, some, in layman's terms, the connection and the network between two thoughts. You know, and if you notice, people use a lot of light bulb. The Edison's light bulb for ideas. That's innovation. You know, you the bulb just uh, goes on. So the connection or the wiring between two or three neurons is where synapses come in. All our experiences, all our experiences create synapses. So everything that has happened to us from the time that we were born or perhaps even before we actually entered the real world, synapses had started developing. So everything, so for example, uh, the big data conversation that Alok highlighted, this fear of whether we should have privacy or no privacy, or these are all fed into our brains over a period of time through different ways and forms and interactions and experiences and lectures. And what happens to us and what does not happen to us, what we listen to and what we don't listen to, all of this is recorded in the form of synapses in our mind. And I'm going to take you, by the way, through exercises as well. It's just not possible that we go through a learning experience. My professors, is please mentally be ready to do these exercises. So these are synapses. Everything that has happened to you, to me, everywhere has been recorded. We have learned. We have been taught. We have created assumptions around our own synapses. Media plays a very, very important role in our synapses. So, because and this is what needs to be unblocked. In the spirit of discovering our synapses, let me share with you block number one. Now, block two onwards, you've got exercises and discussions. This is block number one. Something that you have never seen, you say something cannot be done. Most of our ideas 
are assassinated by us as individuals primarily because you know what nobody else has done that it has never happened how often have we come across those moments when we discover that it's a great idea but uh, never happened any idea comes to your mind that perhaps was never done and done for the first time anything you have in your mind something an idea that was never one what comes to your mind you know there's like or maybe something that people are telling you today this will never happen were you ever told let me go back into the chat were you ever told that uh, we can't go for vacations to the moon were you ever told we can't go for vacations to the moon take a special weekend away day at mars my guess is you were right okay chat please chat i i like speaking to people new normal non normal were you ever told something like that anything like yes no are we there we are not there i'm not too sure but so can you hear me <laughs> so yes you know you will never live forever okay i know maybe you will um, it depends what you call living there are many people who are breathing but they are not alive there is being very really philosophical right uh, i can't change water to wine today 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 you never know look at what all resources are being used to create energy uh, banana peels fyi 20000 banana peels could provide electricity to 500 homes okay so this is also we need we tend to feel strongly for idea but not so much for others yes that uh, yeah okay I, i'll close on that okay bring that up love to hear the word vacation these is that's coming from a lot of heart i can see so this is the first block to coming up with ideas and this is what we need to challenge first one just because the people say it has never been done does not mean it can never happen this being a classic example you know who this is you can also take a stab at the name if you want you probably know who this is what this event is all about this is ages back so many things happen imagine how many people would have actually said this cannot happen uh, there's a very interesting book i'd recommend it's called um, you can kill an idea but you can't kill an opportunity you can kill an idea you can't kill an opportunity and that opportunity is created every moment in our minds uh, sadly and interestingly others love killing it that's another what you said so others love killing ideas and Uh, the best part is the indicator that it's a brilliant idea is when you hear many people saying it can't be done because when people say it can't be done that means there is a possibility because you feel the need for something like that i was reading somebody in 1959 saying that people would go for vacations um to the moon to mars and uh, here you have the boy for the middle east that entire intervention the hope that they have created for the arab world today it's not too far off another example more recent okay i'm going to take you with neil armstrong here take this one you know what this is anything with plastic is bad plastic is bad plastic is bad plastic helps us create uh, people use plastic uh, recycle them and have created clothing as well so there's a lot of t-shirts that are created using plastic uh, who would have thought of that ages back your um, uh, shopping bags the plastic shopping bags could be used on the roads to reduce skidding um with the rubber so with the rubber you you put that to plastic the polythene bags can also be used there are so many million brilliant ways of actually resolving however what is most convenient is like don't do it as opposed to thinking why not to do it why not come up and explore what more can be done and that's a powerful question people could be asking but they fear asking and even if they do ask the idea is that they get the immediate response but who's done it that's a killer so that's the first block so remember next time any time somebody say this has never been done If there is a possibility because one of something that i learned long time back was the best way of saying i wish i would have done it first is to do it first so the best way of actually making sure you don't have to i wish i would have done it first is to have actually done it first that's the first block let me quickly take you to the second block and this is where the exercise is begin a sculpture block something i have seen but cannot happen here now this is a little story which so uh, you are aware of uh, what happened is i had a friend once and he wanted to explore agriculture He was into farming, and we were looking at what more can be done. And one of the ideas that we discussed, uh, that came up as a result of our discussion, was he was into uh, watermelons. And I said, "Why not have square watermelons?" 
his immediate reaction can't happen why never happened i said okay but there are people doing it he said no 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 i'm speaking of him he said my joy is it's organic it's pure i don't don't want biogenetically engineered seeds creating square watermelon i said you really don't have to do that either uh, how many of you have seen uh, square watermelons how many of you have seen square watermelons let me go back into the screen and chat how many of you have seen seen square watermelons square watermelon i have built yes any who else right seen seen anybody not seen anybody not seen yes uh karan uh, sara sara no let me show it to you and i'll then i'll tell you what the story was over here so uh these are the square watermelons uh, so i actually had to show it to my friend now, now there's now there's also a difference in the blocks for me at that time i had to come up with an idea for my friend before seeing this picture that you have in front of you it was a perceptual block it has never been done so i said you know what here it is it can be done so that's a cultural block somebody else does it we can't do it his argument then started off it's going to be too expensive these are premium i said exactly if they if they cost you to produce you can charge a premium at it as well and the best part is there's really no expenditure because this is how you create fresh organic non biogenetically engineered seed based watermelons uh this is how you do it there's a one time capex of a box a wooden box as you can see when the watermelon grows to a particular size you put this into a box it automatically takes that shape and here you have and this is what they have and they started off in japan this is when my friend hit the second block so having shown it to him he saw it can be done but then he said okay you know what we can't do it because there are things that we have learned and over the years we have experienced it and this is where the synapses create so new synapses were created for him before seeing these pictures there was no synapses so it's a perceptual block when he saw this and then his argument we can't do it is a cultural block how often has it been you have looked at ideas either you yourself in your mind or others have said you know what it can happen there it can't happen here the famous dialogue they can do it we can't do it he has the resources we don't have the resources she can do it i can't do it it can happen in that part of the world this part of the world is very different that's an argument before even giving an opportunity to an idea to breathe you just kill it off at the word go and this is what we come across let me take you through a little exercise how many of you know i am not trying to test your intelligence so i just want to bring a little bit of fun i'm sure you know your abc would you be kind enough to sing abc for me could you be kind enough to please sing your abc with me so if is it possible that i can hear a few of them i heard that i can bring a, a few people on the screen as well yes farhad you can how can okay. i invite people on the screen okay uh, any volunteers before i just keep on picking on people i don't like to pick on people it doesn't sound right but uh, any volunteers you want to okay you can mention on the chat and i'll i'll help farhad uh pick you up to the stage who wants to volunteer susan okay i'm looking you up hold on hi susan are you there <coughs> susan Susan, you can. I send you an invite, but you can also people. click ask to share audio and video. Oh, no, we can't hear you. Okay, now. Hi, Susan. Good. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Good seeing you. I'm enjoying this. Okay, I. I okay, I'll, I'll I'll Saad, can you Bring request? I'll approve. <laughs> okay, I wouldn't mind having Faris and then Sarah. See you, Saad. Bam. I see Faris. Faris. I think what a feel. Hang of it. I've been able to connect. So Saad. 
Okay, I, okay <laughs> let's just try. Sounds Okay, while other people try, in the interest of time, I need to do one very interesting exercise for which uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to Adam as a result of that. But let me do the first one. Uh, Faris, Susan, and Soph, because you did not do this exercise, and Saad. For my joy, would you please sing ABC from A to Z? Just out of pure love. All together? Hi, Swa. Okay. Yes, all together. You want to see ABC I song? ABC. ABC song. Okay, A, let's B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. L, M, N, O, P. You are my Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know my ABCs. Know my ABCs. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I'm doing this. Uh, uh, I'm doing this uh, team building for a particular client of mine. And we're doing this collaboration teamwork online. You guys, I think without you being taught that that's the power of Sila, I guess. Uh, oh, then I have to spend 45 minutes explaining how do you create a team and this and sing together. You guys did brilliantly. Coming back to the topic, I'm speaking of synapses. Now, what happened? When we were young, we've learned A, B, C. So, you know, when we were born, we perhaps didn't have the alphabets. We got educated, we learned, we practiced it, and now we know it. So, in our brains, the minute I say, could you sing your A, B, C? So, there's a particular light bulb that went on in your brains, which said A, B, C, I know it, and we went forward. And somebody also said, uh, you, Saad, I think you continue, now I know my A, B, C. So, you know, the complete storyline, the reason why it came out without even thinking about it, whether I should, I shouldn't, is because the synapse is built on it. Cultural block. We've been learned how to do it and how to break it is looking at it from a different perspective. And it is difficult. For example, could you please sing the same thing for me again? But do not go from A to Z, go from Z to A. So what it may sound like is Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S, R, Q, P, O, N, M, L, K, J, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. <laughs> I'm not cheating. Okay, I can't see you. <laughs> I invite everybody, even if you're not online on the screen right now, I invite everybody to try it out. I'll tell you what's happening to you. Just try it out. Okay, so okay, I'll I'll follow you, so do, do try it. <laughs> now, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> can't get past Z Y W X Z Y W S. No cheating. R V. No. You are. I need to write it out. Yes. Okay, and other it's not possible. I invite you to do it. Okay. Now I. Uh, ah, you see, it's not possible. Ah! Yep. That's why yep. you just killed an idea. This is I'm sixty plus. I can't do <laughs> the process. Okay. So now, now, <laughs> now, this is exactly what happens. See, this is how synapses play a role in our thinking. Imagine how many synapses have developed over a period of time, and we've always agreed that this is how it is done. And when we give and get an alternative, it is difficult for the mind to accept. Change management 101, for those of you who want the business and the leadership side, change management 101. People don't resist change. It is difficult to recreate the synapses. And my guess, even if you were not online, Susan, thank you, Farid, Saad, my guess is when you were trying to do the right order, you were saying Z by X, perhaps then silently went U, V, W, then you were W, V, U. Then you went in your mind R, S, T, then you T, S, R. Exactly. O, P, exactly. Q, Q, P, O, L, M, N, N, M, L. That is ex exactly, I'm so glad. Thank you. You see how the mind functions? This is perhaps the only way I could have explained how the human mind functions. It likes to piggyback and go immediately into the right answer. And uh, if you go deep dive into it, that's also a source of a lot of ego because the minute people say, it can't be done, this is not possible, this is not for me. It's the synapses that are overly active. Um, the the D hawk of the founder of Visa Cards, the plastic money, as you call it, uh, said it beautifully. He said that the challenge is never how to bring new innovative thoughts into our mind, but how to get the old ones out. So this is what uh, culture block is. I hope everybody loved, uh, understands as well the um, perceptual block, something I've never experienced can't be done, which you just saw perhaps others for the first time and is impossible. So the uh, culture block is now you know it can be done. It just requires a lot of practice.
and the more you practice the easier it becomes so thank you very much guys everybody i would love to give everybody a loud round of applause so even if you're not on the screen i can't tell you i would like you to give a loud round of applause to susan faris and sir so thank you very bye much bye bye uh, any comment you do get in and says i don't want to look dumb or be me. exactly susan spot on that is where it becomes active thank you okay with that taken care of let me move on to my next block uh, and from what i gather i just may have a little bit more time as well uh i am going to 10 more minutes let me get into the fourth block because the last block is also very interesting so this is the third block the third block is actually and this perhaps happened numerous times while the, this this topic in itself emotional block could take us into a lot of detail a lot of conversation these are uh, feelings that come in the way of bringing ideas to life fear embarrassment as very rightly uh, susan highlighted in the comment section how will i look would i look bright would i look bad would it work would it not work often times by the way even in teams now this is the I, i love sharing flip thoughts sometimes when you have your team members who are not taking action people say this person does not take ownership uh, is not responsible interestingly enough somebody with a high level of emotional block is also not taking initiatives and not being proactive not because they don't have responsibility they don't like to take responsibility but they wouldn't like to be responsible and be uh, the reason why the team fails so think of it that way that you could have team members who are not taking action because they have emotional blocks they are not too sure if they should or they shouldn't so this is where the third block comes in and we all go through it all the time uh, even for example uh, my first day at sila too i was like what should i wear should i wear my shoes or should i wear my crocs and i decided to go with my shoes it was only in sila too after the third day i decided you know what it is safe to get into my crocs so the best of us could be affected and in every single moment this comes to life uh, i have it i had an emotional block when i was i was told i have to use hop in and by the way just 5 minutes before we could start the internet collapsed and like <gasps> i have to do something fortunately i did not stay stuck in the emotional block we came up with a methodology and we are able to move forward so that is where the emotional block comes in how to break the emotional block if if you notice i did not share with you how to break the perceptual block not done might as well do it cultural block if they can so can we adjust it practice it it can be done that's why a to z z to a emotional block uh, this is something that you what you could do is you this is door knob as you can say and we call this door knob fear the idea is most of the people in life are holding on to the door knob should i should i not would it work would it not work would it be like would it not be like to be very honest open the door go in what's the worst that can happen with you and if you can survive the worst possible outcome why hesitate people say, ah, what if i lose my job nobody loses a job for sharing an idea i mean in organizations people say, ah, what if people laugh at me let them laugh I, and i get a lot of inspiration on breaking free from emotional blocks from uh, patch adams for those of you who don't know patch adams please watch the movie it's an amazing watch for the weekend patch adams and it's a real life character if you don't know google patch adams up uh, he's been my inspiration for something like this and those of you who watch the movie i happened to meet somebody who works with patch his name is robert holden he's a happiness guru and i asked robert i said is patch really as crazy as they show him in the movie So Robert says, "Oh, they show nothing in the movie." So this is how crazy, uh, in uh, our language, crazy. That's what synapses are. Um, patch could actually be, and this is where you could actually learn how to break free from our blocks. So that taken care of, and now I'm about to get into my fourth and final block, which will then, with the final exercise, I'll also conclude this particular turbocharged session. is the well, are you okay with by the are you okay with the three blocks again i'll go back to the chat is everybody okay with the three blocks so this is the um door knob fear as i said so most people holding on should i should i not if that is done yes everybody good with this one so i'll move on yes all right keep on going with thumbs up yes okay let me ask you a question okay this uh, could you get a glass of water with you if possible if you have a glass of water with water in it it would be great as uh, so could you have a glass of water and you have a glass of water i i need somebody who i need about four five people to have 
a glass of water. And once you do, you could just. Uh, yes. I'm so here to help our glass of water get people in the up. Empty. I don't have yes, a glass yes, of water, if but those of you who have a glass of water, let yeah. me know. <laughs> let me know in the chat box. Okay, all that. Paulette, I see you. I see you. Unfair, I'm unfair, picking unfair. you up. I'm picking you up. You just Paulette, need to Heather, approve. Yes, Paulette. Thank you. Who else? How how many people do I you want it... for hot? I would love to have four people, five people. This is so. Less anybody so else get a glass of water? Get well. one. <laughs> if you don't yeah. have one, get one. <laughs> A wine glass of water would also do, by the way. I'm not risking my wine, Farhan. <laughs> <laughs> it is much more easier. I Armel is getting, getting one. Getting okay, Armel. I'm putting Get you up. up. Perfect. Armel is getting it, Paulette. Um, Paulette, I've, I've, okay. I've requested. So you just need to approve. Hold on. Can you can you ask uh, can you uh, Paulette you can you can ask to share your audio and video on the top right of your screen on the hop in. Ashok has a glass of water. Yeah, I'm putting Ashok in. I am so happy. You know, and it's at these moments when you're looking for volunteers, it is primarily your friends who keep coming again and again because they trust you. With new people, they're like, oh, what is this guy going to do now? Arm, Arm, now, if you get your glass of water, oh, then um, share your share your audio and video, and I'll approve you in. We need you to request. Okay, Anun, I'm pinging you in. Okay. Half empty. Oh, good. So we have, oh, many. Oh, I don't mind more people. I think we can move on. So as soon as we get the uh, people on, so there's Anun, there is uh, Saad. Okay, Ashok is there. I, 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 like, okay, sure. Okay, so, sorry, no you issues. You can try it later on at your. You can try it later on. I haven't ha added my browser. Yet. Okay, never mind. But at least if you can hear, we've got uh, one, two. Is, Saad, okay, I'm so putting have, you okay, in. We have Anun. Get your there. glass, which is half empty or half full. It, it's not. It's not showing my uh, video. I don't know why it, it happened. You. No, at, at least we can hear you. Then. Armel, yeah. hear you. you're up. Share with us then. Okay. Okay. Armel, how are you? Raise your okay. glass. So, in the interest of time, again, as I said, let me start. Let me let me start. Okay. Now, this is the fourth block. So, I've already spoken of the perceptual block. Something that I've never experienced cannot be done. Cultural block, they can, we can't. Emotional block, sheer apprehension. The clue is door knob fear. Open the door. Uh, jump in and let's see what happens next. If you can survive the worst possible outcome, you might as well. If you, if you feel yeah. that people will laugh, uh, be a source of joy to them. Yeah, there's really no issue if people laugh. As long as they don't cry, that's a big one. Okay, now, um, fourth one. My question to everybody over here, and I'm just using uh, my friends. Okay, I'm just, I have requested you just to participate uh, so that you could be an example to the others. Others are more than welcome to try it out at your own risk later on. I have this glass of water. And it's half full. My question to the friends on the screen, what would happen if I turn the glass upside down? What would happen if I turn My the glass computer upside down? My computer will be damaged. There's water in it. Your yeah, computer <laughs> will be damaged. Yes. Ashok, Armel, what would happen? Water will right. fall down if you are not fast. <laughs> Water will fall, and Armil just did it. If you notice, the water did not <laughs> half glass of water. The, the, the most common reaction is, and this is what the synapses does. You know what? If I put this down, water will fall. Um, and uh, Ashok, you said the same thing. Saad said, Armil, uh, his synapses work slightly different. He said, Okay, you know what? I'm going to drink the water. I'm going to turn the glass upside down. See, and I managed. If, however, I ask you to. Um, what other thing can be done? So you, you're not allowed to drink the glass of water. That was a nice creative solution as well. If I ask you, you don't, you can't drink the water. What else could have been done? Question. And I do want you to take the glass upside down. So, Without yeah. the water spilling. What Burning else could have been done? The other glass. Uh, 
nice thinking. Yes, I have yeah. another glass as well. That is true. Only is not half a glass. <laughs> Good thinking. What else can be done? We are looking at opportunity, mm -hmm. and this is challenging imagination. What more can be done? Water a plant. Yes. So you're not throwing the water. You're using yeah. the water. What else can be done? If I'm you, saying, put the glass upside down with the water. If I'm the with pop, the water in it. What else? Waterfall on you. Waterfall <laughs> on you. <laughs> Take a shower. And, shower. <laughs> could you? Could you? Are you willing to bet? Are you willing to bet that water will? Yeah, that I can do. Are you willing to bet? Who's willing to bet? Yep. You're like one of those uh, red and blue that Bill plays with us. Oh, I know how oh. to do it. I'm going to turn my computer yeah. upside down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just very quickly stand up. I'm going to go a little bit. Show you. Looks. Okay. So what did I ask you? I hope you can see me. I said, glass of water, upside down. My friends who are watching it, Try it out at your own risk. Okay, so when you want to try it out later on, make sure you're doing it at your own risk later on. Uh, Adam tried it. Adam said he got scolded by his mom. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear Adam speak uh, towards the end of this. Okay, glass of water. This is water. I'm holding on to it, and the water goes down, and yeah, and the water is still here. Okay, centrifugal force. Oh, the cat is upside down. Yeah, ah, no, 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 okay, okay. it's a centrifugal force. But you notice how the immediate reaction worked. How many things and how often do we come up with this? And I, do try it out, do, do try it. Saad, Armin, do try it. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just try Make sure your laptop is still away. You know? I, I made sure my laptop was away. No, 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 I need I, to get Why don't you try that. it? Let's okay, give me a second. Okay. Armin, you'll try it? For, for can, you, can, you, can you make your screen bigger instead of sharing the other screen? Share your... Yeah, <clears throat> we didn't see okay. the. You yes. can see. Can you, can you screen share, Farad? Okay. okay. Yeah, is this better? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's much better. Good? Yeah. This is good. Okay. So yeah. Three glass. Ah, so right. doing it here and here and back <laughs> and there you go. I hear all <laughs> Farad, as yeah, long yeah. as you will be responsible for the books behind me, it belongs to Sarah. <laughs> you, you can answer Sarah and Severa. <laughs> Do it at your own risk. That's why I said, uh, Adam, Adam did it. Adam did it. I'm doing it with my mother as well. And then you're going to clean up. Uh, can be done. Uh, it's just right there. It's not easy. It's just like you hold it like this. You hold it like this. Side. Bring it down. And go for a complete swing. Don't ball like Malinga, <laughs> but a complete swing ball. And here it is. It is very much possible. Yeah. Moral of the story being, you notice the immediate reaction can't be done. There are different ways. And this is actually the fourth block. I'm not going to put on the slides again, so that you can see me life size. But uh, this is the fourth block to challenging imagination, which is intellectual and expressive blocks. This is when the world comes up with stats, figures, researches numbers why something cannot be done i mean how often have we come across it i remember i was part of the mountain dew launch in pakistan and uh, uh, this product they had launched uh, pepsico had launched this product in mid 90s the product <coughs> had gone. Uh, we sat again together in 2003 and we said okay we need to relaunch it and perhaps it was one of those rare case studies where a product was launched bombed and then launched within a decade and became uh, an overnight success my biggest challenge in that was that when we were speaking to the sales team was, listen, you know what this will do? Because the pushback was, it won't sell. And this was not a perceptual block. They had launched it. It, was, it wasn't a cultural block because this product had not worked in a particular market. It wasn't even an emotional block. It was out and out an intellectual block that I was trying to understand because they had facts, numbers, figures of what happened last time around. And that had to be broken. It required a lot of convincing using logic. Now, how does this, these blocks help you in your personal life? Whenever you're speaking to people and somebody says something cannot be done, or some, this is unknown your point, when somebody says something cannot be done, try understanding what kind of a block are they bringing forward. If somebody says you can't do it because it's never done, you're trying to address a perceptual block. When they say they can do it, we can't, you're addressing the cultural block. When people don't have any logic to why something cannot be done, but it's just a sense of feeling you're addressing somebody's emotional block. 
Similarly, when somebody gives you a lot of data, facts, research, and reality of the present world, that's an intellectual block. You need to use logic to find it out. So again, as I said, I've come almost to the end of my session. So if this is good on timing, I think it's good on timing. We so have I've come to the end left. of my session. Uh, my request is do. Okay. So all I want to say is that uh, you know you could possibly uh, look at the kind of blocks that surround you. So you have ideas. My request is when you go to bed today over the weekend, uh, think of ideas that you have. Think of what is stopping you. And remember, a block to you may not be the same block to somebody else. That may be a different block to the other person. But it's critical to understand what it is. So you could zero in and address those particular blocks as opposed to going in different directions. For example, somebody has an intellectual block and you give a pep talk to that person. Just wouldn't work. You're trying to do a um, different, you, you're not giving the right medicine at all. Similarly, if somebody has an emotional block, you can't give intellect and logic to that person because driven by different needs. So all in all, this is something I've been using, as I said, since 1999, when I took on the Unilever assignment, uh, worked on it, we've, we've used for process improvements, we've used for product launches, we've used, keep on using it for regular conversations as well. So when somebody says something cannot be done, they are, it's time to challenge their own imagination. And magic does happen. That brings me to the end, by the way, officially to my session. Thanks for the time. Maybe so you want to add something. But Armel, thank you very much, Saad. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you. Uh, to everybody else, do try A to Z and Z to A. That's how your synapses will increase. Um, watch Patch Adams as a movie for emotional blog. And try this at your own risk. So thank you very much. Love being with all of you. I love you all. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming back so promptly at 10.03. I would like once again to thank Arj for the panel. And I wanted to point out that when it was suggested that he wear that scary mask, actually, it's not just because there's an evil genius or a child in him, maybe both, but there was no problem about asking him to don that mask. And if you think about it, why? I think it's because there is an implicit fascination with all of us in Jedi Knights, whether they be good or evil. I think there's a fascination. Who's not fascinated by the Force? Or about members of secret, and not so secret, spiritual orders. In fact, it is a constant of fantasy that there are fighting monks, that there are holy men with swords. I do not know whether our next speaker actually can wield a sword, or for that matter, a Star Wars lightsaber, but I would not be surprised because his accomplishments are so manifest that might be one of them. At any rate, when the venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi joined us for our reunion in Delhi in November 2017, coming all the way to Delhi to address us, he was one of the hits of the program and we still discuss the talk that he gave us. It is our great honor to have him with us again today. And to introduce him, I'd like to show a short video. Welcome, everyone. Hello and welcome, Venerable Tenzin. Thank you for being with us today. It's a delight. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I hope you're doing well where you are. Uh, <laughs> where are you right now? Um, I am in Arizona, so not in snow, which is good. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Well, that is fortunate. Um, well, so I just want to kick off so we don't have a lot of time and I'm sure there'll be many, many questions, but um, I just wanted to transition from, for those of you who have been here for the previous panel, um, the things that we were talking about were social media and the power of it, whether it was for good or for evil and really touching upon um, the the turbulent times these days and how technology has really leaned in and taken over such a big part of our bandwidth in our space. Um, question I wanted to ask you is this topic, uh, emotional resilience in an age of exponential technologies. It's a mouthful. I know it's something you've spoken about before. Can you share with us just the what is this topic and the importance of it today? I, I think the, the sort of uh, main point of this thing is that you know we romanticize the idea of exponential technology but we are not entirely uh, sure of its impact on human behavior you know humans have evolved over thousands of millions of years and we have only learned to adapt to things at a certain pace and when we sort of uh, create technologies and deploy them at an exponential pace uh, it does not always mean that we are meeting technology uh, behaviorally where, where it ought to be. Uh, so that's one part. And emotionally, the emotional evolution of our brain is actually much slower uh, than, than, um, than uh, we give it uh, credit for. Um, and the third part of it is, which, which I think is, is, is uh, sort of something to ponder more deeply about, is that, you know, we humans, we like to think that we are uh, rational thinkers and rational decision makers. Uh, but the fact is that we are not, you see. We, for the most part, make decisions that are rooted in emotions, meaning it's certain forms of emotional states that actually prime our decision-making abilities, our perception. But what we love to do is rational storytelling. So I'll, I'll make a decision and then I'll go back and try to sort of mask it with a rational story that why I'm so wonderful that I made this thoughtful decision. Oh, um, do you see this as something that are people who do this? I mean, who? Because because we as a human species, there's there's so many of us. There's those of us who are supposed thought leaders and we're, you know, head of governments and CEOs. And then there's those of us who are really just, you know, in for the ride to consume information. Do we all do this? And, and what what do you see as the difference? No, no, we all do this and we all do this to, to tremendous capacity, um, you know, and, and that's something that. Uh, you know, we sort of, you know, the, the whole field of emotional intelligence got popular, you know, uh, about two or three decades ago, uh, you know, mostly to sort of juxtapose with the kind of emphasis we were, we were putting on IQ, you know, and an understanding of this thing that EQ is, is as much important. And what we are seeing now in organizations, governments, uh, any place is that leaders are more instrumental in setting the emotional tone for the environment. Okay. And emotional tone of the environment matters a great deal in terms of the organization's, not only efficiency, but also whether there's trust in the organization, where there's loyalty in the organization, whether the workers are happy. Uh, you know, those are all sort of considerations that are made by setting the emotional tone. And I think there, uh, you know, leaders play sort of more of an instrumental role. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I think I'm of a generation, and maybe you perhaps, I'm not sure, but many of us are of a generation where if you're a leader, you are, um, you know, we're raised with the narrative of it's about hierarchy, it's about what you know, and that's what sets you apart as a leader. You're supposed to have the answers, and that is what's important, and all this emotional stuff is considered soft. You know, that's kind of the feels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it'll sound tacky, but the old soft is the new hard, <laughs> you know, in terms of skill sets. Um, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that's where, you know, we had been mistaken for, for the longest time because we, we, as leaders, sometimes we like to think that we need to maintain sort of a sense of stoic uh, appearance and so on. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, we see more sort of entanglement of emotions in boardrooms in board environments um, than anywhere else. Um, and, and, and that's why I think the, the complexity of, of the emotional life of brain and how emotions prime us, how emotions are involved in decision-making uh, is something that any you know, self-aware leader 
or self-aware organization needs to kind of uh, uh, pay attention to. And this is kind of now sort of an accepted hot topic. Uh, you know, the the added sort of caveat to to all that is that you know we are still dealing with sort of a generational transfer of of power from previous generation to the new generation, and and we think differently about emotions. But the fact is that we are all uh, emotional beings. Mm. So, given this topic is emotional resilience, my question is. You know, the IQ to EQ conversation has been happening for a while, soft skills, the new hard skill. I'm, I'm still totally taking that. How would you say is the difference then, well, between emotional intelligence and emotional resilience? I mean, what is emotional resilience anyway? That, that's, a, that's a good sort of a differentiator. Um, uh, you know, uh, emotional intelligence for the most part had focused on, you know, just giving some kind of credibility to understanding emotions and, and for people to sort of recognize their own emotions. Uh, you know, uh, many of us are not even capable of sort of being able to call a particular emotion for what it is. And then there was the sense of understanding or recognizing other people's emotions. So that's where we go into sort of empathy mode and, and, and so on. And, 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 and as I said earlier, everything has emotional tone. How we make business decisions has emotional tone how we vote has emotional tones politics is entirely an emotional game you see uh, so the the resilience part comes in is where we learn to regulate emotional states uh, meaning that you know there are all kinds of resilience uh, in human behavioral sort of disposition and that's one of the things that makes us uh, somewhat different from other species that that we are resilient so we are able to adapt um, you know, again, at different degrees. Um, uh, if you if you look at the the spectrum of how humans adapted to the pandemic, some adapted more easily, other adapted uh, uh, differently. But the emotional resilience part is where we not only recognize emotion in ourselves, in others, but we are able to sort of regulate it. We are able to sort of change the tonality of emotion. Uh, in terms of where we are, um, so the emotion of the group, the emotion of the environment, the emotion of the tribe, um, and that's where the resilience part is, is useful. Understanding which emotion is more useful in this particular scenario than what we may think is a natural reaction to that scenario. So would you say that emotion, the, the kind of a center point when we talk about EQ is it's more of an awareness uh, an ability to be aware of where we are and where other people are, where emotional resilience takes that and then levels it up by then being able to navigate and regulate and actually do something beyond just be aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So simple thing like, you know, if you're in an environment, either in organization or in civic society, where, um, you know, people don't trust each other, you see, trust as a currency is lacking uh, overall. Uh, it has deeper implications, you know, it threatens civic institutions, it threatens, uh, uh, you know, to, to encourage more polarized conversations and so on. So now as a leader, if you're thinking of, well, I need to quote unquote, heal the society or balance this out, then you have to start thinking of, well, what are the ways in which I can introduce trust um, in this population? What are the ways in which I can build trust? So one of the ways in which we can build trust is teach people to be more empathetic, for example. Um, teach people to be uh, to cultivate certain kinds of deeper listening skills and so on. So those are all aspects of this resilience framework uh, that we can introduce so that we can change, um, uh, again, the, the, the tone of a, of a larger population. Um, so one thing I wanna to say to the audience, this is a super interesting and e deep topic that my brain is even firing with questions. Uh, this format of this is a fireside chat. So if anybody does have questions, please chat it onto the stage and we will incorporate it uh, as we can going through this because this is like layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna ask my next question. Looking at that, it looks like it requires a lot more in dynamic and turbulent times. Um, where do you see technology impacting like what are the pain points that are getting pressed upon right now uh, and i know see is a big thing so whether it's through populations or however it is where's the intersection between technology and the pain points where resilience is faltering or required 
So, so again, the, the, the challenge here is that, you know, certain kinds of technologies, especially social media platforms and so on, um, have tend to amplify our conversations and therefore amplify the, the emotional tone of certain kinds uh, to a degree where it's very difficult for individuals to both digest and process things. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's a, it's a multi-layered uh, challenge, multi-layer challenge in the sense that, you know, so much of my current work is around ethics and governance of uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and machine learning algorithms. And, and one of the challenges is that the regulatory framework is oftentimes missing. Uh, you know, it's only that when we start to see widespread damage in civic society, that governments become very active and say, okay, you know, now we need to regulate this thing. But they don't necessarily have the know-how of how to regulate these things. You know, my my joke, which unfortunately oftentimes is true, is that governmental agencies are ten to twenty years behind technological developments. You see? so so the damage is already done by the time they come to their senses about how to create regulatory frameworks. And as we have seen in cases of certain platforms like um, uh, Facebook or, or even Twitter in certain degrees, to certain degrees, is that those kinds of regulatory frameworks are important, meaning they're not going to automatically regulate, uh, you know, whether these particular channels will, uh, you know, minimize polarization or polarize conversations of, of certain sorts, you know. Uh, so imagine this, you know, if in old days I was part of my tribe and I had a different set of opinion, I could only commiserate with only five other people of the tribe and saying, hey, uh, you know, I think X and the entire tribe thinks Y, but we think we are the chosen one and the special people and so on. Today, that X number is manifold, meaning I can, I can sort of literally uh, select, you know, uh, my tribe from a, P P uh, a population of 5 billion or so on. And therefore, this, this instant amplification of, of, of this voice, this instant sort of uh, merging of interest groups in a manner that it is becoming somewhat threatening to, to civic society, to democracy, and to other enterprises. So, you know, I'm going to ask about that because it is kind of a conversation specifically about the roles of governance. And, and, and to a degree, we traditionally rely on governments and regulations to protect the individual from a barrage of, of nasty, evil things that come around us. Do you think that the role, the, the whole conversation about whether uh, like Facebook or Twitter should be a pub publisher that actually does editing or a platform where it should, it's all for their own? Do you have an opinion on that, what their role should be and if it should be done independently as its own um, entity, its own business, or its almost own nation state in a way, or should government step in? No, no I, I think the government needs to step in. Uh, it needs to step in in the sense that I don't think, uh, you know, uh, regulatory frameworks are one-sided kind of thing, that it needs to be a public-private partnership. Uh, you cannot rely on just Google and Facebook to self-regulate. That You know, it's, it's possible probably in a utopia, but as we are seeing that, you know, Google's own sort of challenge with their ethics board. Um, that you might have been seeing in the in the last few weeks, uh, or Facebook's own challenge with their ethics board, you know that they're not sort of qualified to self-regulate, and that's why it needs to be a public-private partnership, uh, and they both need to figure out basically, you know, uh, where the where the middle grounds are. Um, you know, having said that, you know, it's 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 a broader threat. It's a broader threat in the sense that the way we have developed and designed certain kinds of algorithms. Uh, that it can get the most intimate sense of your behavioral dispositions, meaning that sometimes these algorithms can understand you better than you yourself are aware of in terms of how do you make certain kinds of choices. Now, there are certain things that we have understood. You know, so for example, uh, we can say that you know, uh, uh, if somebody has an alcoholic disposition, the ad algorithms should not constantly blast that individual with ads for vodka or whiskey, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have understood that part. We have even said, you know, that about smoking industry and so on. But there are other forms of addictions that we haven't looked into. But the 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 ad algorithms are designed in a way that that they will simply pop up things, knowing, you know, what your sort of dispositions are in in, in some ways. And so that poses a, a different kind of challenge, because 
um, in some ways it is impersonal, meaning that you know you cannot sort of put the agency of a particular individual behind that algorithm. But on other ways, it is very personal because each of these algorithms are designed to sort of personally get to know you. And, and I think that's where the, the, the regulation needs to come in. So that's so funny you said that because on the previous panel, I was the person who said, I am all in of ads. My life is about targeting you to sell my products, to sell my skincare <laughs> products. So I wasn't the other side of the fence. But what was interesting, and this goes back to a topic I want to revert to about trust, because it just came it came up on the stage too. Um, it came up and from Susmita. Um, well, I I was saying that I was all in, but my point was, you know, part of it is intention of how we interact and what is the product that we are actually pushing at them. So, of course, skincare, alcohol, you know, but but you raise, you know, I was struggling to see an example where it can have a negative spiral, even if unintentionally. And I think alcohol to someone who's addicted or cigarettes is a perfect example. Now, with that being said, in a world going back to I think we when you were talking about emotional um, resilience and, emo and EQ, uh, the question was, and then I have something to add on to that, what about your own, one's own willingness to be vulnerable as a step of building trust? And does this apply differently when you're in an offline setting of humans versus online and interacting technologically? So again, you know, th th these are sort of some, some uh, certain kinds of behavioral dispositions that we don't have complete clarity on. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, the use of technology is generational. So the opinion is generational uh, in, in certain ways. Uh, you know, so when it comes to say, even questions around vulnerability, uh, you know, the previous generation has a different framing around how much vulnerable they want to be and probably never want to appear vulnerable. You see, that's part of the strength conversation. But if you look at, you know, Gen Z, and so on, you know, they embrace a certain kind of vulnerability, meaning, you know, uh, they are they're okay with sharing every episode uh, of their life on 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 social media and so on. Uh, I mean, you know, if you, if you come to think of social media, it's like reading your personal diary in, in, in certain ways, you see. So imagine, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, you walking up to somebody and saying, hey, uh, I just met you three minutes ago and I'm one of your 3,000 friends on Facebook. Let me read your personal diary. You see, imagine the response we'll get from the other side. But today, again, there's a whole generation that is somewhat okay with it. You see, but what they're not recognizing at times is that in sharing these uh, deep, intimate experiences on a public platform, on a public setting, what they're also sharing is certain kinds of behavioral dispositions and behavioral vulnerabilities to the point that it can be manipulated in terms of how they see the world, what kind of news becomes visible, what kind of ads become visible, and so on. And that has more of a danger of creating an echo chamber, you see, uh, uh, and, and which is you know, what the problem of a polarized society is, that we all sort of start to then dwell in our own bubbles because we are not seeking interaction outside of this bubble because we are happy. We are happy with this idea that, oh, I have 3,000 people who think like me or 300,000 people who think like me. I don't need to step outside and try to figure out what other people are thinking. And this in some ways sort of narrows down even our ability to empathize. It narrows down our ability to break down tribal boundaries, which was sort of the first in some sense of uh, principle of why we designed internet, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, these are the challenges that we are, we are, we are facing at a much more, uh, you know, faster pace. And, you know, people who are for emerging technologies, again, I, I don't want to be a doomsday scenario, you see. Uh, but the thing is that we need to get out of this mind of techno utopia and think that technology is going to solve all problems for us. So that's an actually interesting thing to think about it because there is there is a narrative and maybe it's not a lagging narrative, but more of a close narrative, close narrative saying that vulnerability is, is, is such a buzzword. It's such the key thing about building trust and being open. And implicit in that statement is the is the thought that if I'm vulnerable, the other person will be will be open to receiving that vulnerability in which the interaction that follows will be positive. And, and what you're suggesting and stating without any judgment, but just true fact, it is something if you're not aware of in a context, in a setting where it's all about data and polarization, 
vulnerability can actually be exploited to a point where it can be unhealthy. So just sort of check where you just, vulnerability is not just a good thing all around. It just, it like anything else needs to be checked and moderated with the medium. That is correct. That is correct. Meaning that there needs to be the trust element um, uh, that is there. And, and to say that one can trust social media platforms, I think is a, is a exaggeration in some ways. So, okay. So, you know, the question was vulnerability to build trust. It looks like you need to trust it to be vulnerable. So figure that out, guys, work on it. <laughs> Next question. Jay, Jay asks, in terms of the use of AI and machine learning, what do you think are the most ethical concerns we face? I think, uh, you know, the first thing is, as I said, the, the absence of any kind of regulatory mechanism, uh, even to build a consensus around things, that's a big challenge. And I think this was one of the things that we had last talked about when I was in Delhi uh, with you guys. Um, you know, EU has done somewhat of a, uh, a better job in, in terms of trying to sort of bring it to the forefront of civic concerns, you know, um, in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it, it goes back to this whole idea of, you know, who's morally responsible for certain things that happens, you see. So, you know, uh, we gave the example of self-driving cars uh, in terms of, you know, um, in case of accidents, who is held liable? Uh, you know, that's something that we haven't sorted out. And, and, you know, is it a hardware issue? It's a software issue. Do we sue the company that makes the sensors or do we sue the company that makes the algorithm? Uh, you know, uh, does the driver or the owner have any ownership of this thing? So we have done, you know, quite a few surveys around these things and the opinions are very diverse um, and, and, and very challenging. So that's one thing. The, the, the second part of thing is that, you know, even... Um, uh, people actually do not recognize at times the dangers that that uh, these technologies are making you know one of my students is working on for example the use of machine learning algorithms in criminal justice system in the united states you see so from an efficiency perspective it's great because uh, you know if a judge can only see 10 cases a day with an assistive technology like uh, like a machine learning platform, it can probably see 50 to 60 cases a day. So efficiency is great. But the fact is that those algorithms were trained on such biased data that it's it almost you know reinstitutionalizes certain kinds of biases uh, against minority demographic and so on. But what it does is that it distances the judge from decision making process in the sense that the judge can basically say, hey, I simply responded to what the algorithm asked and the decision was made by the algorithm, uh, you know, don't tell me that I am biased or don't tell me that, uh, you know, I'm white or don't tell me that uh, I have, uh, you know, implicit bias against uh, uh, this particular kind of demographic. So what happens is that we start to make these kinds of distancing in terms of decision making and start to blame the system. And the system itself had been trained on sort of historical bias data. So th these are kind of things that we are seeing in um, you know, law enforcement uh, systems. We are seeing it in civic governance systems. We are seeing it in marketing platforms, and 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 that's why you know I, I think uh, it it requires much more sort of interrogation of of sorts um, before we begin to sort of deploy it at large scale. You know, the other challenge that you have to understand is that all dominant AI systems are owned by five companies in the world. It's your Tencent, it's your Baidu, it's your Alibaba, it's your Google, it's your Apple, and so on. Uh, and any company that is developing a new novel sort of AI product, their dream is to get bought by one of these companies. You see? So you have to ask yourself, you know, uh, in the long term, what would it mean that every aspect of your intimate data and your interaction with civic society or anything is going through the filters of one of the five companies uh, you know you have essentially sort of outsourced every aspect of your priming of your decision making of your worldview to to these groups well speaking of a uh, priming and biases paulette is asking about u.s politics and social media we don't have time to talk about how we deal with fake news but how do we regain the integrity and truth in our political system that is going to be a uh, very, very challenging process. Um, uh, I think uh, democracy everywhere is in a very vulnerable scenario. Uh, 
you know, and it's not the perfect form of governance. Uh, you know, let's be clear about that. Uh, there are very sort of inefficient aspects to democracy, but it is somewhat of a better form of government governance that we have come upon. But one of the key things about a healthy democracy is that it has the ability or capability to self-correct. And if a if a democratic environment or system cannot self-correct, then you know it gets exploited uh, by uh, by other autocratic or interest groups and, uh, and and so on. So I think you know rebuilding trust, of course, remains an important uh, aspect of uh, rebuilding democracy in certain ways. Um, fake news is here to stay. Unfortunately, uh, it would uh, simply imply that the burden is on the consumer. Uh, to develop their filtering processes uh, in, a, in a healthy manner, to be able to decipher what's true from fake. And it is going to become much, much more challenging with the barrage of, you know, again, uh, AI-assisted fakeness of things, you know, uh, that it's not just about news. We can manipulate images. We can manipulate data. We can manipulate, uh, we can create human images and videos that don't actually exist. Uh, in reality, um, uh, we can manipulate me saying something that is completely against my personality type. You see, so it, I think it's going to become more and more challenging, and it puts, unfortunately, or fortunately, the burden on the consumer to start cultivating their mind of discernment. You see, mm -hmm. uh, discernment is something that a healthy civic society should value and we um, as in members of the civic society must learn to cultivate it. We're going to go back to the topic of cultivating discernment in the end. Uh, let's then let's let's ping that for later because I definitely want to hear your thoughts on suggestions and advice you'd have for us. Um, other questions that came up from Harris, what can we do to build emotional resilience in our circle of influence? in our lives and in people we influence? I think the, the, the key thing is, you know, uh, firstly to develop uh, uh, levels of listening uh, in, 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 in the group that you are wanting to do this work. And by level of listening, implying that see where they are, all are um, in their own emotional states, meaning individually. And then you can sort of analyze and come to this idea of, you know, where the group is, is, is there emotionally. Uh, you know, there needs to be, you know, a healthy conversation again around uh, what sort of emotions or emotional tones are actually useful or helpful um, for either your family or your group or the organization um, uh, that you are leading. Um, is it there yet? Uh, if it's not there, you know, what are the interventions that you can design to to facilitate uh, that kind of process so it all starts from the sense of um, uh, of listening at, at a deeper level but but you have to sort of value this thing value this world and again you know not all work around emotional resilience needs to become therapeutic you see uh, this is not psychotherapy this is actually how you build a resilient organization if you have to survive. I mean, you know, one thing you have to recognize, you know, in leadership circles or these kinds of circles, you know, people used to, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the more popular questions was, you know, where do you see yourself five years from now? You see, I can assure you that 90% of individuals who answered that question in 2015 were dead wrong. You see, uh, you know, meaning that one thing that 2020 has done is that it has increased our aperture for uncertainty. And so you have to recognize both as individuals and as business organizations or governmental agencies is that uncertainty is here to stay. It was always here, but it is here to stay. And that, you know, things like when we designed best business practices and things like that, you know, all those playbooks were thrown out the window. Nothing was working that effectively uh, in, the, in the face of what we were facing this past year and continuing to face. So it becomes a question again that, you know, how do you, train a group of individuals to become resilient to face these particular kinds of challenges. And, and that should be sort of the longitude and a long-term investment for any leader uh, for their organization, I think, going forward. No, I have to ask, when I hear about emotional resilience being trained in, I think resilience is, is like 
how resistant are you to an invasion or something? So how do you measure emotional resilience without stress testing? So it's like a, it's like fire drilling your team. Are we better? Are we better? We're going to create scenarios that will stress them out and see how they react. I mean, there's got to be better ways. No, I mean, stress test is, a, is, is, is useful in certain kinds of scenarios. But uh, but no, I, I think, you know, there are, you know, again, these are, as I said, that, you know, these were not part of the usual playbook. So we don't have the best sort of assessment mechanisms yet. You know, we have some assessment mechanisms that are useful, but they're not always sort of the most effective ones. Uh, but there are simple things, you know, uh, you know, for example, you know, um, measuring a sense of satisfaction or measuring a sense of contentment, a sense of loyalty, measuring a sense of joy in work environment. Those are kinds of things that, uh, you know, lend itself to this idea of a resilient environment. Um, you know, and, and, and I think those are the things that can be measured and each group can design actually different kinds of uh, 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 assessment sort of uh, 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 tools. Uh, to do that, but again, understand that this is a this is a long term investment. This is not something that you say, oh, you know, let's have five sessions on this thing, and by the third month, the, we will declare our company to be resi emotionally resilient certified. Uh, you know, beware of that's like selling snake oil. Uh, you know, uh, so be be aware of those kinds of uh, uh, pro uh, propositions. Especially if it's targeted to you on an ad on social media for nineteen ninety five. Yeah, I know. It's it's it's, it's just it's just. It's just craziness, you know, the, the way these things develop, you know, like, you know, one of the things that has become popular is uh, mindful leadership or some version thereof, you know, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, so, you know, everybody was like, oh, you know, scientifically tested and scientifically certified and it does this and that. And, you know, these were, you know, like most scientific experiments, they're done with a very sort of narrow protocols and narrow environment and so on. And then now, you have research publications that are actually challenging those uh, those validations that occurred like 10 years ago, 20 years ago around this whole thing of mindfulness. You know, so there is this thing that, you know, the, the these kinds of things at times can backfire, you know. Um, um, uh, and, and so, again, we have to be careful of, of how we apply these things and, and and what is the outcome that we are we are seeking. You know? So next question, Kumdini asks. Being a survivor of trauma, I've been immersed in a chaotic emotional mind for as long as I can remember. I'm an empath and that makes it more difficult. I find that one of my coping mechanisms to anything that triggers an emotional response is to let my reaction play out in my mind and then thinking through that mental scenario. In essence, observing my reactions and then basing my actions on my observations to myself. It's convoluted. Does anyone else do this? Is this healthy? <laughs> uh more people do this than you can imagine. Um, is it healthy? Only in a controlled environment. Uh, it's not healthy in the long term, uh, simply because uh, then you reduce against the aperture of your of your uh, brain functions to think uh, or process emotions in any other form. Is it? Um, the you know there there are a variety of tools on how people process emotions, especially that, uh, uh, you know, uh, those that are traumatic in, in certain ways. Um, the first thing that a person needs to sort of develop is a sense of, um, um, I would say, detachment at will, you see. You know, in, this is a simplified version, but our mind, you know, uh, I'll, I'll put in the, vel uh, the, the analogy of uh, Velcro and Teflon, you see. You know, Velcro, right? So when you get your brand new shoes or anything with Velcro, it's all nice and clean and so on. And over a period of time, it just captures dust and gunk and all this thing that within a week or 10 days, that shiny Velcro is just laden, you see, with foreign particles and, and, and looks pretty dirty kind of thing. That's an untrained mind. That's a mind uh, that is sort of uh, clinging on to every aspect of any emotion, thought, everything that arises, you see. And at, after a while, it almost becomes unusable, you see, meaning a Velcro that is filled with gunk, after a while, it, it loses its sticky quality, it becomes unusable. As opposed to Teflon, the non-sticky kind of uh, surface, you see. So there is a virtue in developing this kind of non-stickiness in our mind, meaning that 
You don't have to believe everything you think. Uh, you don't have to believe all emotional responses or reactions that come to your mind, meaning that we have the ability to cultivate a degree of objectivity Say, to separate ourselves temporarily, to look at emotions, to analyze it and say, is it useful? Is it con conducive to my well-being? Is it a helpful response? And the more we are able to sort of increase the ability to suspend, you see, such interactions with emotions, the more we give ourselves bandwidth for a thoughtful response. You see, what a thoughtful response simply implies is that I have taken pause to reflect I have taken pause not to immediately engage into a reactive mindset. So playing out emotions, storylines, drama in your head is a useful tool to a certain degree. But at some point, you have to start being this observer who's able to sort of suspend these things at will, um, just in this non-sticky kind of mechanism. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. I have a next question. <laughs> Irene asked about November 2020th, the Korean monk Hamin Sunin, he had 1 million followers on Twitter, see the chuckle, and a popular meditation app faced a scandal. Many people felt that they were helped by his tweets of will wisdom, including me. And Buddhist followers in Korea called out his lifestyle. It is not according to the Buddhist way. He apologized publicly, took his Twitter down, and returned to the monastic lifestyle. Is this cancel culture or was he actually going against Buddhist ways of living? Or is there another thing that you, you'd say about this? Uh, now we are sort of borderline gossiping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it is against a Buddhist monk's vows to gossip. <laughs> when it's an event with the SILA network and it's okay. It's uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I know him. I know him uh, from our early days um uh, when he was still living in the u.s um i i think uh huh, um, let me put it this way <laughs> uh let me put it this way you know there's a lot of noise around what is helpful and what is not helpful to the point that we have blurred the distinction between spiritual cultivation and self-help see uh, and you know it's an irony in some ways to think that we have evolved thus far that we are making exponential technologies that we think we are you know developing or progressing as a society uh, in certain ways and that self-help is a multi-billion dollar industry so, you know it's 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 a it's a contrast that we need to be mindful of. It's a contrast that we need to be mindful of that what is this thing called progress, you see, when we have to actually create a multi-billion dollar self-help industry, see, meaning that what is it actually doing to humans? The, the idea is that, you know, you have to understand that, that we have created buzzwords like well-being, we have created buzzwords like authenticity and so on, but we actually don't have archetypes for it. Meaning, have you ever asked yourself, what does optimal well-being look like? See, we have more conversations around sicknesses and illnesses, see, but we don't know what optimal well-being actually looks like. See, uh, one of my f uh, favorite philosophers, uh, Krishnamurti uh, Jiddu, uh, uh, you know, he said that uh, you know, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So you see certain kinds of trends that are developing in self-help groups in coaching groups and in, in, in things of that nature, where you have to ask yourself, you know, what is the long-term goal of this thing? You see, uh, is it simply about managing certain challenges that we see in the short term, or is it actually about evolving to become a better version of ourselves? Is it actually evolving to become a better human, a better civic citizen, a better leader, and so on? So these are all conversations that are that are you know deeply tethered and tied to these things. And everybody thinks that they are being helpful, I'm sure, including this monk. And you know, when you're living in a society of seven billion humans, 
everybody is going to find something that is helpful. Does that justify doing that? You see, and, and those are the things that I think you know we need to sort of deeply think about. That if it's if it if something is helpful to a certain subset of population, you see, is it justifiable? Again, remember that we do tend to rationalize uh, our, our choices in certain ways. Uh, so it's a longer conversation, but uh, perhaps uh, better to steer away from gossiping. <laughs> I'm gonna follow up on that real quick, and I don't know if sure. it's gossip or not. But when you say it's justifiable, is that specifically in this con in this context? What it, what is the trade off? Is because the comments helped a lot of people? Like where where how does that play out in this specific context? And why you think there's such conflict in people's minds about what's being said and expectations of behavior and the you know and and the so. Let me, give you, let me give you a simple uh, example, for example, uh, you know, uh, um, that it's it's widely acknowledged that we are becoming a society that is challenged in its ability to pay attention to things. You know, short attention span is is a, uh, um, you know, it's a it's a sort of wide challenge, a wide issue. Right. Um, as a behavior, as an individual who's trying to affect behavioral changes, right? Should I cater to the population in a manner that I say, well, it's too bad they suffer from this kind of, a, you know, um, a short attention span syndrome, and they can only absorb two minutes of any conversation. So let me just break every everything down into two minute sound bites, you see, and cater to that, or do I think about how to mitigate the root cause, meaning mitigate the sense in the sense that, you know, can I help them in a manner where I can actually increase their attention span? You see the difference? That one is simply catering to the symptom that the person has a two minute attention span. Let me minimize the sound bites and cater to them at that level. You see, yes, they will find it helpful, but it is not going to sort of address the deeper root cause of increasing the capacity to pay attention to certain things. You see? And chances are that it'll filter out in other aspects of their lives. Other aspects of their lives, meaning that, you know, it's one thing that if I have short attention span to lessons or lectures in classrooms, but what does the short attention span do to the ability to experience deeper relationships, deeper friendships? Um, uh, long-term decision-making and so on. You see, these are again things where the jury is out, meaning that we have not been able to study it because it's such a short-term phenomenon, meaning we are seeing it just in the last 20 years or so. The one thing, and I'm gonna move on to Bill's question, but this does go into uh, emotional resilience. Now I'm, I'm listening for where are areas where I have to sharpen my own tool to distinguish between action and reaction. Do you think that we as a people are at a place speaking of the two minute attention span, where we associate almost, we almost idolize people or solutions. And we, and, and it's kind of like, if you are going to preach something, you have to be so hundred percent a certain way that you become bulletproof. If not, my brain cannot handle divergence between you saying one thing and you doing another. And so yeah. these yeah. idols have to fit into certain molds because we as the receivers may not be able to have the flexibility to grasp that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, you know that's one way to put it, and 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 it's it's you know, and again, you know, it's like when you go to car dealerships, you know, they might try to sell you everything, but mileage varies by the behavior of the driver, and so each individual, uh, you know, the mileage may vary how you cultivate these kinds of techniques or tools for resilience, but you have to ask yourself, you know, as as you are the best judge individually, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is of importance here. Uh, you know, and 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 uh, you know, if short attention span is going to become the fashionable thing, and it is going to become the trend, uh, which you know, most of these things are the tools that people are developing, you know, in gaming, in apps, in any kind of thing. It's always about how do we cater to short attention span, rather than can we challenge the syndrome itself? You see, and 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 that's where I think you know. Um, um, uh, I think we'll begin to see more of uh, deeper challenges as more, as more study and researches are conducted. 
So Bill's asking, do you distinguish between resilience as returning to the status quo and post-traumatic growth, taking one beyond the old status quo? What's involved in the latter that takes one beyond mere resilience? No, resilience is not just elasticity. It's not, you know, one sort of traditional expression of resilience was elasticity that, you know, you stretch it and then it comes back to at least where it was kind of thing. But we know that even elastic, when you keep stretching it, 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 it fails uh, to come back to the original position. When we talk about resilience, it simply implies that you know, one is able to adapt and adapt better to certain kinds of challenges to then put oneself in a position to think about where do we go beyond this for next thing. Otherwise, what happens is this conversation that we are happen that we are having since last year between the old normal and the new normal kind of thing. You see, so one can say that just going back to old normal is a certain f form of resilience. That you know, if you came out of 2020 unscathed, unharmed, and simply bounced back to old normal, uh, that, that is some degree of resilience. But the fact is that why, you know, the old normal was not a glorious normal. Uh, you know, we were miserable as usual. So if we have an ability to sort of create a new normal, to envision a new normal, that's a different kind of process of resilience, meaning that we, we are not just adapting to what we were familiar with, you know, or what our comfort zones were, but it is coming to that stage, but then reimagining what the future is going to look like. But you can only do that, you know, sort of in a state of calmness, not in a state of panic. You can only do that in a state of, um, you know, flourishing where, where you are um, sort of rooted in this idea of what flourishing looks like. So there are different aspects to, to, to this kind of resilience. Uh, but it's, it doesn't always strictly imply just getting back to the, the sort of old uh, behavioral patterns where you were. So Alok's got a question, which happens to be my last question as well. It says, perfect timing. Thank you, Alok, um, saying great discussion. So what are the tools to enhance attention spans, mindfulness, and meditation that we can imbibe and share with our kids as society struggles with this? And added on to that, or what are some advice, suggestions, and takeaways for us to increase our emotional resilience? Um, with the kids, you have to be cautious. You have to be cautious in the sense that uh, stop lecturing them on meditation and mindfulness. Model the behavior. Uh, model the behavior meaning that if you are able to model uh, that you are being measured uh, about your own outbursts, your own reactions versus responses and so on, chances are that, you know, that would sort of um, uh, have much more of a deeper impact um, uh, when you're trying to sort of convey these things to kids. Uh, but, but things like, you know, uh, learning to spend some time in quietness, learning to spend some time in nature, uh, learning to spend some time alone, you know, that was one of the biggest challenges with, uh, with this pandemic, that people had lost their ability to spend time alone. So it was tormenting, you know, it was torturing. You know, but we humans have also flourished in the sense of solitude. You see, so what does it mean for an individual to be tortured by a sense of loneliness versus embracing a sense of solitude? You see, the both the input and the outputs are radically different uh, in that regard. And you know, so th this idea that cultivating some of those tools in an incremental manner. Um, uh, I think is 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 useful. Uh, you know, talking about emotional states is is useful. Why we why we see the world in a certain way, why we respond in a certain way, is 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 useful. But the best thing is to model the behavior. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a leader, the best thing you can do is model the behavior because lecturing on these things is futile. So, which behaviors do you think that we should be model? For the adults in the room, <laughs> similar kinds. <So. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the that's the beauty of emotions. Emotions are highly contagious. You see, uh, people think that you know emotions are these personal things that you can just pent up and keep up, uh, keep uh, you know somewhere in, your, in in yourself. But the fact is, the moment you walk into the room, you don't even have to say something. Uh, you can affect the emotional tone of the other individual. You know, just imagine, you know, when, you, when you're sitting with somebody who's depressed and discouraging, 
you immediately feel that. You feel depressed and discouraged. If you're in the company of somebody who's encouraging and joyful, you feel that. You feel the sense of encouragement and joy. You know, one of the things in our social circuitry as, 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 as social creatures is that emotions are contagious. And so why not make kindness contagious? Why not make compassion contagious rather than making jealousy, envy, hate? contagious. So we are not just creating these emotions or manifesting these emotions, but we are also instrumental in amplifying it. So it is best, not only for ourselves, close friends, family, and civic society, that we learn more about it. We learn to regulate it. We learn to challenge, channel, channel it in, in, in ways that are actually helpful for the world at large. So that really does go to the narrative is the better that we can make ourselves. Um, it's not really self-absorbed. It's actually the best thing we can do if that's what we're going to end up vibing out to the universe and other people. Yes. And vibing out is not a choice. That's what I'm saying about emotions, that, that you are going to vibe out. There is no way to stop it unless you are sort of pent up in a room, uh, uh, you know, in a cave in the Himalayas. Uh, even then, you're going to freak out the animals around you. So emotions are contagious. That's not a choice. So the more responsible thing is, what kind of emotions do you want to model and manifest? Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. This was a great discussion, conversation, and the questions were awesome. Uh, if any of you are interested in learning more about Venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, please check out the Expo at the booth. Uh, you can buy the book. It's in Everything Goes to a Foundation, a Project Fire Foundation, but it's a fascinating book. Arj can speak to that too, uh, to learn more about his uh, personal journey and um, uh, Venerable Tenzin. I want to thank you so, so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. It was a delight. Thank you. Thank you. And Venerable we'll Tenzin, thank you so much for joining us at the CELA Virtual, the first event. And uh, I'd, uh, I'm going to also plug your book. I, I read it uh, literally about a month ago, and I highly recommend uh, folks uh, read Running Towards Mystery. It was uh, just a wonderful way to share share your life and journey and, and uh, just how you encourage us to just break down all of these layers and barriers we've, we've built for ourselves. Uh, I did miss you at GNS. I was not able to make it to Delhi, but I'm so glad uh, you were able to join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Meta, for such a fabulous moderation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Arj, we're still standing. At the oh, end boy, of we made it. We made it. And uh, our videos are still working, Adam. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that's a blessing. To all of those who made it to the end with us, all of uh, our attendees and participants, especially those who are in uh, East Asia, it's late at night for you. I don't know when you snuck out to grab dinner or to put your children to bed, uh, but I'm sure you did. Thank you for being with us all this time. We have quite a lot of people to thank. Arj, as you know, it is a huge team effort. Uh, starting with yourself, I'd like to thank uh, you, but I also would like quickly to add that when I showed the video of the 2020 roundup, all uh, the things that Sina had done, I wanted then to say, and now I wanted to thank especially Chamira. This is Chamira Laknat. Many of you know him. He's the Sri Lankan founder and creator of Capture Eye. Uh, he's a future SILA member. He's been with a number of the SILA academies where you saw him doing the videography and so on. And he put together that splendid SEMA SEMA uh, 2020 video for us. Thank you, Chamira. And uh, Adam, I'd uh, also like to uh, thank a couple of our board members for kicking us in the butt and getting us online. Uh, thanks to Soph and Meta for taking the bull by the horns, pushing us to get online, um, uh, checking out this platform for us, You know, conducting uh, trial runs. Uh, dragging us all the uh, board members and, and uh, making us go through our paces. So really appreciate uh, Stoff and Meta for, for getting us here. And then may I also say thank you very much to Aisha and you for diving in uh, and really sinking your teeth into, into this platform. And who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right, Adam? <laughs> Aisha and I are both barking. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Soph also for her work today. She's been backstage 
uh, helping things along. She's uh, uh, we couldn't have done it without her. And of course, I, I applaud standing uh, my colleague Aisha Shalkatullah, who was the pillar behind this. However, uh, the proof is in the pudding. So a thing is only as good as the production and the value for our attendees. So I hope that uh, you will vote with your eyes, feet, and fingers by attending our next event when we hope to, uh, when we're going to have Nadia Jackson-Bayeva. I also hope that you will continue to get the word out about SILA and our virtual programs uh, by uh, following us on, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook, and all of our social media platforms. Help us get out the word because your su support really is needed. Last word from you. You're the chairman. Well, thanks, Adam. Really appreciate it. And thanks for threading your energy all the way through this, uh, to this event today. Really appreciate it. Folks, see you at the expo booths. And all see right. you next time. Thanks.